Eric, this is Kelly. She's their CEO. Oh, Kelly. Hello. Meet you. Nice to meet you as well. You got a goodie bag there? Or what? Uh, yes, I have some things. Unfortunately, I don't have any of the really cool stuff. Well, then we don't want it. What are you doing yes. here? Um, seminar. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we um, we opened an office there a half months ago. Okay. Uh, okay. After not having questions here. Sorry. With, uh, the yes, I did. Yes, about a month ago. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, Eric and I are friends from way back. Yeah.
We're going to get started the whole meeting at 12.05, May 10th, 2023. We respectfully acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the unceded traditional territory of the Sushwetmik. Move to approval of the agenda, recommendation that Shushwa Paling Center design be added as a late item under item 6F and that the community, uh, committee of the whole meeting agenda for May 10th, 2023 be approved as amended. Could I get? Welcome. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Gonna move on to adoption of the minutes. Recommendation that the minutes of the committee of the whole meeting held on April 12th, 2023 be adopted. Malcolm, Ian, thank you. All in favor? Carried. Okay, we have delegations today. So I mean, there's a lot of enforcement in this front row. I've never felt safer. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, Sergeant Murray McNeil from the Sycamus RCMP. Thanks for being here, Murray. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, here to talk about our uh, fourth quarter report from uh, January to March 2023, wrapping up the uh, last fiscal. From the page, please, Kelly. So, with uh, again contributing to safe roads, there's the traffic tickets uh, 34, 39, and 62 for the months respectively, January through March. And uh, you see the previous quarter, the previous year, 21, 22. Uh, just about the same, 66 uh, in March, uh, more in February, and uh, a little bit more in January. Uh, five members working had an average of nine, so slightly below the, the standard that we set at 10, a total of 135 stats for the quarter, which was uh, lower uh, than in 180, 188 in 2022 and higher than 108 in 2020. It's more uh, impaired drivers that we were dealing with this quarter, had uh, four in January. Uh, two in February for a total of six, and that's double what we had uh, previous year. Where we only had uh, three impaired drivers uh, for the same quarter in 2022. Uh, moving on, we had uh, no fatal collisions, it's always uh, good to see for the quarter. Five injury collisions, only one was uh, of any real significance. That was one on uh, March the 6th. We had a single vehicle uh, off road eastbound near Old Sickness Road on the Trans Canada Highway. A uh, vehicle went down the embankment and rolled. It was a quite steep embankment there, as we all know. Uh, some injuries to all four occupants. There were some uh, young ones in that car as well, uh, but nothing, uh, nothing too terribly bad. Uh, the other ones uh, are all minor in nature Highway 97A and Elliott, uh, minor injuries, February single vehicle rollover TCH at the last spike. Uh, semi losing control in the four lanes and uh, March 21 driver westbound vehicle rear-ended another one. Uh, I was there for that one. She was uh, all worried about an appointment. She had a salmon arm and was looking at her navigation and not the proper in front of her. So, yeah. Three contenders, we had none for the quarter, which is uh, very good. Uh, hopefully, we continue that trend. Uh, there were three in the previous, uh, previous year's quarter, so uh, that's an improvement. Uh, theft of vehicles are always is a couple of those to mention. January fourth, we had attempted theft of a 05 Sierra from Clear Road. The ignition was damaged on that vehicle. Uh, January 10, uh, we did recover. Uh, this made a little bit of news. Uh, an old four, uh, I think it was an Infinity, if I remember, uh, from Tim Hortons. Uh, two, two suspects were arrested. They were given a court date. Uh, the vehicle was taken from a dealership in Kelowna. Uh, they had given fake ID, got a test drive, and then uh, decided they were going to make their way to Alberta. And they were the vehicle, made it this far. Uh, February 1, uh, it's a 2001 uh, F-350 stolen from a business in Sofqua, and it was recovered the next day in Salmon Arm. And then we had a 20-foot boat uh, taken from a storage facility, and it was recovered in Tappan minus the outboards. Someone obviously looking for the outboard engines there. Uh, in 2022, quarter four, we had three vehicles reported for comparison. So there's the property crime totals, uh, 2023, 2022, pretty similar, uh, 19 total versus 17. So no no large trends uh, popping up. Uh, theft from vehicles, we had more this time, uh, compared to two in the previous quarter. But the big one was the uh, no break in engines. 
And then the uh, next slide uh, just shows all of our, all of our uh, files for the quarter. Uh, pretty comparable, 424 total to 401. Uh, nothing really jumps off the page aside from uh, abandoned 911 calls for some reason. We had a bunch of those, and that typically comes in the better weather. People are out uh, doing recreation, either sledding or out in their boats, and we get a lot of pocket dials, whatnot. Um, and also people just driving through on the highway, they're trying to get a signal type of thing and uh, end up dialing us. It's off the tower on the highway, and then, then they're on their way to Revelstoke or, or San Bernard. Uh, resources, uh, Constable Adam Poitras uh, just arrived in the DPAS this month. Uh, he previously worked in Salmon Arm, so uh, and he, he was uh, raised here in second week as a boy. His, uh, his father was camping in for some time, so his picture is on the wall in the elementary school. So, nice. Yeah. So he's happy to be here. Uh, and uh, he's a tall guy. If you're driving around Sick Moose, when you see a guy that can easily dunk a basketball on me, that's Constable Poitras. <laughs> <laughs> he's about 6'7, so wow. he stands out. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Uh, criminal, car, criminal code charge approvals. We had uh, two cases of wind driving, uh, breach probation, and assault. And we also did a search warrant uh, in the quarter on a residence on Capel. And we got two firearms out of that uh, residence. That was in, I did a press release on that. There was an altercation between the resident in that house and another person in town. And then that led us to doing the search warrant and getting the two firearms. So uh, that's the report for the quarter. Awesome. Thank you, Murray. Questions? Good job, Murray. Yes. Go ahead, Council McKay. Thank you. <clears throat> Is your new member uh, going to be living in Sycamus? He bought uh, near the airport in Salmon Arm. And his wife is, uh, she's working in EHS and she will be working uh, ships in Sigmas as well. And the station. Oh, excellent. Anyone else? Go ahead, Councilor Bushel. Good job, everybody. Thank you very much for everything right. you guys do. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to stick around and listen to the next two presentations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mary. Okay, so moving on, we have. BC Conservation Update from Eric Taikodi, uh, Conservation Officer, Service North Okanagan Zone. So you'll see Eric's face around Zikamus a little yeah. bit more because he's uh, stationed at Salmon Arm and looks yeah. after Sikkimus. Yeah. Go ahead. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, everybody, for having me. And yes, as Pauline said, uh, I'm, my name is Conservation Officer Eric Taikodi. Um, there are two of us now in Salmon Arm um, after having nobody for a very long time. Uh, my colleague Steve Cook could not be here, but uh, if you happen to see a very tall conservation officer, just like Murray's new uh, uh, member there in Sycamus, that is him. I think he's 5'8", uh, or not 5'8", sorry, 6'8". Uh, but uh, today I'm here to talk to you folks just uh, a little bit about um, some bear issues that have been happening in the Sycamus area, um, and also to discuss, you know, kind of... Um, our ability to now service this area. Now, there's two of us that are very close by. Um, so I'm just going to see if I can get this to work here. Okay, here we go. So the Conservation Ops Service, uh, as many of you probably know, we are responsible for the environmental stewardship uh, enforcing of environmental statutes, as well as the wildlife conflict response and prevention. Uh, our area in the North Okanagan Zone covers Salmon Arm, Sorrento, Tappan, Sycamus, Malakwa, Revelstoke, Enderby, Armstrong, Vernon, Coldstream, Lumbee, and Cherryville. And there's a bunch on there I did not list because it's a very gigantic area. But the main centers of concern for me and Steve are going to be Salmon Arm, Sycamus, and Revelstoke. We have two other conservation officers that work out of Vernon that primarily looked after this area in years past. However, Vernon is a big beast in itself with a lot of their own bear issues. So it's primarily going to be myself and Steve that you'll be seeing out here. So just a couple little facts about black bears here. You folks live in some really good black bear and grizzly bear habitat. So um, they're on the rise in North America. The population last estimate, I believe, was in 2016. They believe that there may be as many as 1 million across all of North America. In British Columbia, we have between 125 to 165,000, and that population is on the rise as well. 
Um, but they're found across all Canada with the exception of PEI. And in, this is an old infographic because this presentation is not mine. It's from an officer who did it a couple of years ago. Um, but even the areas that say that there's few, many more are coming into those areas. They have swung to islands in the Georgia Strait. They occasionally are popping up on the Gulf Islands now where they have historically been absent. We have a very good um, climate for both berries as well as salmon. But the other big thing that I'm going to touch on is um, they do very well with garbage, unfortunately. Um, I used to work on the coast down in Mission, Chilliwack, that kind of area. I was CEO down there for three years, and we see it all the time where typically black bears will have between four, maybe five cubs if it's a very prolific female. On the coast, there's areas where all four or five of those cubs may survive to their second year, which pretty much everywhere else in North America, that does not happen. Maybe one will survive to reach the age of two. Um, and that's again goes to be how much habitat we have and the the resources they have built. So the females will give birth in the den to between usually three to potentially five cubs. They will hibernate with her until the spring. They'll spend their first year with her and then go back into the den in the wintertime. And then around their second kind of April, May, that's when mom kicks them away. And typically when we have bears that are getting in the garbage or doing things they shouldn't be doing, exhibiting habituation to food conditioning, not always, but generally it's these juveniles that are kind of around their second year of life. They're the ones that, you know, start targeting garbage and you know livestock and things like that because maybe mom didn't have the best opportunity to train them on natural food. So habituated black bear, pretty common, <laughs> pretty common image that's all, all along offline. I'm sure a lot of these may have been from the BC park, I'm not gonna name which one, but habituation means the loss of fear from humans. Um, they don't run from people when they see humans, they feel relatively comfortable around people and they're much more likely to come into conflict through food conditioning. Generally, that's garbage, but it could also be bird feeders. It could be um, unprotected chickens and livestock and livestock feed. But the most common one, there's an infographic coming up in a few slides. Garbage accounts for almost everything else you can add together. Garbage is much more prevalent, even with all the other attractants present. So food conditioned black bear, and we're getting some garbage. A uh, bear that has become reliant on our non-natural attractants as a source of food. Non-natural attractants, again, include garbage, fruit trees, bird feeders. Um, it's dangerous for both people and bears. Conditioned bears often become more aggressive towards people when searching or guarding food, much like a dog that has been given a bone and is hungry. Um, a lot of instances of people being attacked by black bears is when they try and shoot them off the food source. That bear reacts defensively to the food source and will bluff charge the person. Sometimes they get a swipe in. More often than not, the second that contact's made, that bear's run and hid because all it wanted to do was scare somebody off. But once that happens, that bear has exhibited a higher level of behavior that was concerned to us. Um, a lot of people on the coast get attacked like this and in the interior, but uh, the majority of black bear attacks on humans, they are defensive. It's very rare that they see humans as a food source. However, just because there are more black bears in North America, it happens more than grizzly bears. So again, situation, food conditioning, unprotected garbage, unprotected attractants, people allowing bears onto their properties because they like seeing them instead of trying to scare them away, which we encourage everybody to do when they're on their property. Fruit trees, bird feeders, beehives and chickens, composts and barbecues. So here's the infographic. Yeah, this is from 2009 to 2013 considerably higher than anything else. 19,000 reports of bears getting into garbage. You can add everything else up there. It's not even half of what all the other attractants are. So going over just what we've had in Sycamus, uh, we switched to a new system, unfortunately. So I can only go back as far as last year, but uh, Sycamus had 32 black bear calls to CO service between April 1st of 2020 till now. And one tenth of those involved, or sorry, one third of those involved uh, bears getting into unprotected garbage. And then we had also eight grizzly bear complaints. Unfortunately, that did result in the euthanization of one grizzly bear that had become far too comfortable around humans, very food conditioned, and was exhibiting aggressive behavior. And that particular instance stemmed from unprotected chickens, but there was some garbage con conditioning as well out there. And yeah. So. 
This shows a bear trying to access a bear resistant container. Wild Safety C has a nice list of bear resistant garbage containers. So the opportunity for residents at persistent problem areas to deposit garbage in a lot of centralized container here means of storing garbage securely at residences and enforcement at residences that refuse to store garbage properly and reduce attractants. This is typically what we've done in communities in British Columbia in the past. Underneath the Wildlife Act, it is an offense to allow bears or other dangerous wildlife to access unprotected garbage. So these containers have been adopted by a lot of municipalities across British Columbia. Um, and also uh, attractive management bylaws have also been adapted. In fact, I think Armstrong just passed one last week. Um, and you folks have a really good bylaw already with your neighbor bylaw that has a section in there that prohibits people from accumulating garbage that attracts, I believe it's raccoons and skunks and uh, rats and other animals on there, but bears are not listed on there. So what I'm hoping to try and point you guys in the right direction of is that's something that could potentially be amended to assist with us. Um, and in a lot of circumstances too, the places I've worked in the past, the attracting tickets issued by bylaw officers, the fines actually double or even higher than what we give. Because for ours, ours is only 230 at the first the first go. It's not that much. And we unfortunately do have a lot of instances where people will either not pay it or they will dispute it. And how the court systems work, unfortunately, is more often than not, they do get fine reductions. So it doesn't hurt that much. We have dangerous wildlife protection orders that we can give that are a $575 fine, and that adds up for every day that they do not clean up their garbage. But again, how the court find it is, they have more often than not, they do get them reduced. So, you know, the municipalities help us out a lot when it's a fine that goes on their property taxes or something similar. And the one that I, I printed off and I handed it to you, of course, I didn't have enough for everyone. But uh, next community east of us, Revelstoke, they have a very good bylaw where it actually talks about how there are specific times where their garbage containers have to be left out and they can't be put out before or after that time. And then the other thing that I've actually, they're, they're one of the better ones. I remember uh, Fork Equipment or Equipment on the Coast, they have a good one like this too. But it limits how people are able to have bird feeders out. Um, they have to have their barbecues and grills cleaned. Their freezers have to be locked. Nuts and fruits on their properties, on their trees and plants have to be picked. I'm not expecting anything like that from Sick News because you guys are considerably smaller. And Rebel Soap also does have a lot of money they get from their own Bear Smart coordinators and also Parks Canada, I believe. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I believe they get some money from them as well. But uh, certainly, you know, in regards to leaving garbage out or adding that, amending the good neighbor bylaw that includes bears, you know, that's certainly something I hope I can demonstrate to you folks, many places have done it in the past, and there's not that many bylaws and jurisdictions that don't have it. There's a lot of, a lot of times people do not want to call us because they're afraid that the animal is going to be euthanized. That's never the first case scenario, or I should say worst case scenario. It is always the worst case scenario. The first step is always education with the community and trying to develop a pattern of what this particular bear has done. Um, a lot of situations that we have in this area in the North Okanagan, there's so many pairs, it's difficult to nail down which one is causing which issues, because a lot of them look exactly the same or very similar to each other. So that's why the education and the prevention before it becomes an issue is so important. So our call center here is managed 24-7. It's an emergency line. Um, it's for reporting wildlife conflicts as well as enforcement issues. Um, and those get kind of dispatched Depending on the severity, it's either an email or a phone call to whoever's on. And again, just we have legislation in place for preventing the feeding of dangerous wildlife, the attraction of dangerous wildlife, um, dangerous wildlife protection order if people refuse to comply with uh, leaving their garbage outside, you can issue those. And then a massive help for us is Wild Safe DC. Um, they have uh, coordinators in different jurisdictions that go out and they assist with things like the construction and man maintenance of fencing, the um, gleaming of fruit off of trees, um, even just going door to door and handing out things like these that talk about ways to protect you know, yourself from livestock. Again, stuff that's already been in this presentation, but make sure your garbage is secure, put garbage out on collection day only, manage your fruit trees. So they're a great assistance to us. Um, unfortunately, though, their funding fluctuates 
And uh, we do have one, I believe, working out of Vernon, but I don't think they've started yet. And again, I don't know how far they cover. Um, it's generally the amount of positions that are available. It goes to the regional district to see if they have interest in funding one. Um, and again, I'm not sure what the situation would be here because Revelstoke is very smart. They have their own. So if you folks be interested in that, you would have to talk with someone else from Salmon Army. It's probably only going to be you two that would be interested in funding it. Um, it's it's kind of fortunate for us that Revelstoke has their own, but in another way, it's not because you know they would be able to support more money towards a coordinator. And then the website there has information that we provide to people on a regular basis. These pamphlets that I handed out to Sarah handed out to a bunch of you are located on there. And it's information resource. These are, I believe they are provided to regional districts also for free, but I have to check that on Wild Safe BC's website. And here's just a instance of a location in British Columbia that had a dump that was not electric fenced. That's it now. The electric fencing does work. Um, I'm not going to go into a deep dive with this. I believe Jillian Anderson was here recently and she talked about some bear issues. Um, she's another resource that we refer people to all the time. Um, she has her own bear electric fencing demonstration gig that she does where she'll go to properties and assist them with setting up electric fencing. And it works really well. It also works really well on situations such as chicken coops in the more urban or more rural areas, such as uh, towards Malakwa and Canby area. Um, they will also, as long as they're maintained correctly, they will also defend against creepy bears. Uh, but they have to be maintained correctly, and that's where a lot of people don't do the right thing. They just put one strand up, and that's not going to do anything to really deter a food condition bear. So that's all I have. Um, if any of you folks have any questions, I kind of I wanted to talk about the the bylaw stuff most. But uh, if anybody else has anything they'd like me to touch on or any questions. Thank you very much, Eric. Council, does anyone have any questions? Go ahead, Councilor Bushel. Thank you, the chair. Thank you, Eric. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, just, uh, yeah, the bears, regards to the bears and the dump around here, we have a, a fence dump. And, uh, yes, I, I didn't mean to show that. Guys, I just wanted to show it as an infographic. Yeah, I think, I think the vast majority of British Columbia are electric. There was a big push about 15 years ago to get all of them electrified. Um, for that reason, yeah, we have uh, we still have a few holdouts. In fact, there was a few where I came from uh, that refused to get them electrified. But uh, yeah, once once they have that food source that's unprotected, their behavior just escalates considerably. So if they have very strong memories, and they have also have very powerful noses. Unfortunately, they can smell food from a couple miles away. And uh, once they've fed on garbage, they will target that because it's full of calories, bad calories, but still it's full of calories and oftentimes sugars and stuff like that, that they want more than their natural food sources. So it's a big challenge. Like you saw the numbers for and now that it's only gone up to that infographic was old. It only went to 2013. Um, I can tell you this year, um, from what I saw the previous slide there, we've had about 10,000 calls so far already for food condition black bears and about, I think it was 60 for grizzly bears. So grizzly bears still lower. Um, but yeah, it's uh, the majority of those again are they're conditioned to garbage. They're getting into people's natural mm -hmm. garbage. So it's it's very very important we get as many people on board with the leaving the garbage locked up in a secure location until collection day and not setting out the night before, not letting people to leave the cans empty out afterwards because even that's an attractant. Even after the garbage has been removed, this scent we recommend people you know they they rinse their bins out with just bleach, no scent at anything, just bleach pretty much every two months. And especially if it's really hot, like we're probably gonna have a heat dome again this year, every couple of weeks, because it's, uh, it is it is a massive, massive beacon. Yeah, I just wanted to, I, you know, our, our group is, uh, I live next door to it, and uh, oh, yeah. it's, uh, it's really well run. Uh, they cover the garbage and uh, it never has any bear problems. That's awesome. Or even for that matter, raccoons or... Yeah. And you, you folks, again, like I, I just wanted to present this stuff and leave it open for your guys' discussion there and put the kind of the bee in your ear for the, the tracted bylaw there. But uh, the, the number of bear calls that you guys have, that's that's actually decent. That's that's low. I thought it was going to be a lot higher. That being said, there's probably a culture of people not calling us because they know that we haven't been around. So now that we know that, you know, people know that we're here, those calls are probably going to rise. 
Um, we've only had a couple this year and nothing that we could really action yet, but we just want to make sure that we kind of put this information before you folks and try and get a bit before the curb. And then also, you know, get the education and stuff like that out there. Um, and that being said, we've spoken to you guys first. We haven't reached out to Sam and Arm yet to do this, but I know it'll be it'll be difficult there as well. Well, it hasn't been difficult here, sorry, but it'll it'll probably be difficult there because we've had some resistance from them in the past to develop any sort of attractive bylaw. So yeah, but uh, that being said, we're here now. Um, we're available. Um, we're much closer than the guys were in the past. So we hope to work with you folks again and make sure that we can make it safe for the people that live here and also for the wildlife that live here. You guys are very lucky to live in such a beautiful location. And you've got uh, a lot of really cool wildlife around you. And you know, sometimes it gets a bit too close for comfort, but you know, with a little a little cooperation, hopefully we can reduce that. Okay, well, thank you for that. Well, we, uh destroyed to my knowledge in the seven years I've been here uh one one black bear yeah yeah, Injured, yeah. soul square yeah and we do we do get that it's just it's a busy area highway one is incredibly busy in the summertime you'll probably see us doing that as well we'll get calls out for injured black bears and injured deer also a lot of injured deer calls um it's fortunately it's, it's never a never a happy day when that has to be done that's why we do these kind of talks is to try and reduce that as much as possible where Healthy animals but that have become habituated with food condition um, are destroyed because relocation in smaller jurisdictions it can work if it's done correctly. It, it cannot work in British Columbia. There's there's too many black bears, there's too many human settlements. Um, more often than not, when bears are moved, it's a it's basically the last resort either that or teams. In British Columbia, we don't do it because they come back. It's it's been proven time and time again in our uh, in our research that we've done. They either will go to the next area of human settlements, or they will be killed by another black bear or grizzly bear. So the only instance that we really do it out here is if it is a female grizzly bear from a population that is endangered, then the biologist will support us moving them. But they have to have you know full full health, no condition, no previous human food conditioning no habituation, no conflict history. And generally by the time people are calling us, that has closed, that's already happened. So that's why it's so important. We, we cannot relocate in this province. So. Thanks, sir. Gord, Council Pleasure. Okay, just one more, Eric. Uh, um, now that you're involved in the community, how, 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 how involved are you with the Snowmobile Club or the Caribou uh, that we have? We're gonna be very much so. Like I, I will be taking that over. Um, I, we haven't started yet. I've already talked to some of the Caribou guys from the past. And I've actually already spoken to uh, Rob Soroya, who's one of the lead uh, caribou researchers in Revelstoke there. So I will be the lead. I don't know if it will be this year, definitely next year. Um, but yes, we are still committed to doing that. We are still committed to the uh, non caribou recovery and ensuring that these areas are still closed and ensuring that that habitat for them is protected. Um, so yes, I'll, I will probably be able to answer some of your questions on that. Definitely next year when I fully take the program over. But they've started grooming me already to you know, how to arrange the budgets and stuff like that. That's why it's never done. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Councilor Rich. Hi, I'm Siobhan. <coughs> apologize for being late. Um, what are the chances in our area of having some of our grizzlies tagged and followed so we have a, a better understanding of what's happening with our so I have to reach out to our bios. I can't remember the last time they actually did that out here. Um, I know they've been more recently, I think, than grizzlies, but um, I'll, uh, I'll bring it up to my supervisor. Um, but yeah, that's that's not really up to us. That's up to the Fish and Wildlife Branch if they're interested in doing that. Um, the good news is they have a separate budget, so they'd be the ones paying for it if if uh, they were interested in doing that. But um, yeah, absolutely. If um, uh, I can provide my cards here, I know my contact info I think was in the plan that uh, Sarah had there. But if you want to shoot me an email regarding that, yeah, absolutely, I'll reach out and see what they say. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, here in Sycamus, we've decided this year that we we're doing our own little social media camp, not little, yeah. our social we So on our social media right now, we have information about bears. Um, Daryl uh, from Public right. Works is doing up some signs. So we have oh, signage going up as well. So uh, we try to get ahead of the curve this year. That's awesome. yeah, really so yeah. because at, at some point it does become a problem and it's it's like it just drops on you. Go, everybody goes, oh, where did all the bears come from? You know, yeah. we're we live here. We know they're coming. So yeah. it's education, of course. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm is, very happy to hear that. So yeah. Yeah, if you need the assistance with those, again, feel free to contact me. Um, and that your information is going to be the same as Wild Saves for sure. But uh, no, that's, that's excellent. We love to see that. We love to see the communities kind of taking the lead on doing stuff like that. 
and we always will, are available to assist when needed. Um, but yeah, you know, we we want to we want to be there to do as much of the education as possible. You know, that's the biggest thing we want to be invested in. But yes, the attractive management you'll always get people that do not want to control their garbage or don't care, and that's why we're enforcement officers. Absolutely, and we do run into that with people just and people just dropping their garbage outside yep. someone's bin. Yeah. which turns into a big yeah. problem. So that's kind of uh, the direction that we're heading. Was, Please don't leave your garbage because, you know. I was recently at White Lake and uh, I was very sad to see that, um, you know, it's not even a busy season and there was five or six garbage bags right yeah. behind their fruit garbage bin that was full. So I, I forwarded that one off to BC Parks and pulled them to smarten up because it's going to get a lot more busier. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We have to respond to a fair and small park like that. And Anka. Wild Safe is part of a program with City of Salmon Arms Authority, two areas. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to my knowledge, I don't know if they've actually hired the coordinator yet. So okay. There's some changes there. Uh, Vanessa that presented to us isn't there right now with Wild Safe. It's a different lady. And so they're coordinating that. And That's good. Once they have a coordinator, they're, they're going to reach out to us. Perfect. If there's any swag or any kind of things that we can hand out. That's so great. I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, um, Previously in past years, uh, Salmon Arm has not been open to um, some of the stuff that we told them. So that makes me happy that they are going the Wild Safe route. Yeah. And then the bottom of our tax insert that's going to be going out at the end of May um, has links to our website and, oh, um, and your, your phone number and stuff. The contact number, yeah, the 1877 number. That's great. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Bianca. Um, oh, just one more thing, Eric, from me. We've talked a lot about bears, but the wrap line covers a lot of other things does, yes. that goes to you. So maybe you can touch on a few yeah, of those absolutely. things as well. So, so we enforced, uh, it's more now, I think it's actually close to 40, but uh, 38 pieces of legislation, both federal and provincial. And that covers everything from the Wildfire Act, the Wildlife Act, the Fisheries Act, Environmental Management Act, and the regulations. So prohibited burning, that's another big thing we get all the time. Off-road vehicle act, so people ATVing in places they're not supposed to, or snowmobiling in places they're not supposed to. Um, and uh, as well as, you know, the Water Sustainability Act, um, there's a bunch of other ones uh, that we look after. But uh, yes, it's it's available as a resource and we encourage people to call us as well. Um, a lot of people don't, uh, we've done a really good job of, of, of promoting it in the past years and I think this year as well, but for whatever reason, we get a lot of people that still don't know that we're the agency to call if you know they, they observe a poaching violation or if uh, they, during the fire ban, a lot of calls get routed to the RCMP. Um, if people are having fires during you know closures, we're the primary enforcement agency for that. We know where all the forest roads are. We know all the places that people are doing this stuff. Um, and then obviously with Shushwap Lake being here, the boat safety issues, the fishing, close time, prohibited gear, all that stuff, that's also us. So the fisheries also enforces that as well. We're fortunate that we're in the same office as DFO. Um, so we have assisted them a couple of times with vessel patrols on Shushwap Lake. And those have both been great successes a few times we've gone out together. And we're looking forward to the rest of the season because it's getting busy now. I know there's another fishing derby coming up this weekend. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to assist with that one. But uh, yeah, we, we run the gamut of a lot of different pieces of legislation. Um, and we, we do as much to get promotion as we possibly can do school talks. We were at the Kelowna Interior Sportsman Show, I think it was a month ago now. Um, and uh, yeah, the calls calls are on the rise across the board for everything. Uh, it's not so much there's an increase in coaching activity or you know, bad stuff going on that's always been going on. It's we're getting a lot more people moving into these areas that may not understand, you know, exactly how to live with wildlife or they, you know, they are just learning the areas and hunting season and stuff like that. Because we do get a lot of calls that are nothing, unfortunately, but uh, we still have to investigate them to ensure that uh, there are things going on. Our call center does a really good job, but they're also human and they have a very, I would not want to do their job. And they, they have this bad stuff to us in the past that is not a CO issue, but um, definitely the prohibitive of burning, the off-road vehicles in closed areas, uh, the fishing violations, the boat safety violations, um, poaching, all that stuff's us. Okay. Um, just one more question, uh, which is uh, when I, the last time I called the RAP line, is it a 24 hour line? Because it is. I couldn't get through last I'm time. not sure. Like, so when, when you call the RAP line, you'll have the automated message. And then there's the option. I believe the first option is to report a wildlife concern. And the second option is to report a violation in progress. 
either of those should put you through your dispatcher, but you're not the only person that's told me that's happened to. I don't know what's going on with that. I can escalate that to the sergeant that's in charge of that. Um, I know him quite well, actually. He's the based out of seashells. But uh, yeah, I've heard that probably a dozen times just since I've come here. Yeah, so we're unable to get. I, I don't know what's going on with that. Um, yeah, well, we'll have to look into it. But yeah, you should always read somebody. You call that line. Yeah, so well, like this information line. that we're sharing with you. So yes, maybe you could escalate that, yeah, that well, up the line as well. Perfect. Does anyone else have any questions? We're all good. Eric, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me. And yes, my contact uh, my contact information, I believe, is in the, the plan that Sarah has there. So if any of you want to reach me or have an email or another question, please do. And uh, we look forward to working with you folks again in the future. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Moving along, we have a community bioheat update from David Dubois from Fink um, Machine, Inc., he is virtual, I think. So, um, David, are you online right now? Yes, I am. Excellent. Can I get you to turn up your your volume a tiny bit or speak up a little bit more? Um, I can speak a little bit louder if you like. That's great. Um, yes, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I appreciate giving you giving me the opportunity to present today. My apologies for not appearing in person, but for those that don't know, I'm a counselor with the village of Cash Creek. Um, Cash Creek is currently under a uh, state of emergency and we are experiencing some fairly significant flooding. So I just didn't feel appropriate to be leaving the community at this time. So I'm here to present to you remotely. Excellent, thank you. Excuse me. So just a, a couple of things. Uh, I believe there was a report that I submitted. I'm not sure if that was included in your guys' package or not, or if that's available. Yes, there it goes. There yes, we have it. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So just kind of going through the report, um, the DE building, which is the district energy building that is being constructed, uh, the concrete work is complete. And as of this morning, we are actually in lockup stage with that. So we've made some really good progress on that over the past couple of weeks. So because we are in lockup stage, we're actually starting to do the installation of the boiler and a number of the different pieces of equipment that need to go in there. Um, so that's all progressing at, at pace. The distribution lines, the current status on those is, is that there is the main line, the first line that was being run to the TA structures main building. That line was directionally drilled before Christmas, and then the final connection into the District Energy Center was completed earlier this week. So that is done. There is the second line that's going to run east-west along the road. They're starting to do the installation of that line there. They're currently just doing some exposing around some of the district infrastructure on the corner of the lot. Uh, that we're anticipating that that's going to be complete in the next two days. That's being overseen by district staff as well. Once that's done, we'll be installing the rest of that main line. As part of that line, we'll be installing a couple of T's for connection to future buildings that it's our understanding there's been some uh, interest in those potential pro potential buildings on those sites. So there's some work going on on those, but if and when those are developed, those are in a position to connect to the district energy system. We will also be installing the line to the second uh, TA structure, which we're calling the large tent that's on site. We're anticipating that to happen in the next couple weeks as well. Uh, the infrastructure inside of the buildings is all ready to go. And then lastly, there's going to be a short connection that will traverse across the road. That's going to be happening in the next couple weeks as well to connect the property across the way. Um, and I think that's really kind of just a real quick summary of where we are at. Uh, we're anticipating that the substantial completion is going to be done by the end of June. Obviously, there's not going to be a lot of heat demand in June, so we're anticipating that startup and commissioning will be happening uh, once there's a demand for heat sometime September, October, and we'll be coordinating at that time. In addition, during the summer, we are anticipating that there'll be some cleanup and in, in terms of final landscaping of the energy center, et cetera. So there's just a couple of pictures there. Those pictures are actually were as of last week, but they're already a little bit of a, out of date. Awesome, thank you, David. Council, do you have any questions for David? 
Councillor McCabe. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just wondering, do you have a secured pot, a secured supply for your biomass? So as part of the contract, I actually think machine is doing two things. We're actually doing two years worth of operations and maintenance as part of the capital budget project. So we're gonna be doing that for the first two years, as well as we have an agreement with the district of Sycamus to provide fuel at $120 a ton. That's what we will provide, be providing, but that's a non-exclusive agreement. The district is free to source fuel from other sources that they'll be able to utilize for that. Based in past discussions with, um, with some of the uh, administration, as well as in particular with the, the fire department, we anticipate that there's gonna be a substantial amount of wood that's gonna be potentially available from some of the wildfire mitigation work that's gonna be happening over the next little while. Thank you, anyone, Councillor Bushell? Thank you for the presentation, David. Um, just a question on operation. Are you gonna operate it from interview or are you gonna be looking to hire somebody or do you have somebody to run it? At this point, the operational requirements are we're anticipating to be quite low. So we are going to be doing remote monitoring of the system um, via the internet to look at what's going to be going and doing the daily operation side of it. We are only 45 minutes away in Enderby. So we will be anticipating at least initially that if needed, when and if, probably in the order of once a week that somebody from staff will be going out to site to do anything. Um, Beyond that, we haven't anticipated hiring anybody, but that that is subject to change. But we're we're not seeing that at least in the short term. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I had somebody inquire, and I sent them your way. So um, thank you very much. No, appreciate that. Thank you. Anyone else? So, David, I have a quick question. Do we have a an estimate of what it's going to cost to get the bioheat from? the station where it is right now, say across the road and to the rest of the industrial park, because that sort of is the goal, I think, at the end of the day. So is there an estimate cost of to hook up to the biomass plant? So just so that I'm clear, are you talking in that existing subdivision that is currently being Correct, developed? Correct, in the industrial park. Yeah. yeah. Um, that has been outside of the scope um, of this project for the capital side of it. That being said, I think there has been some discussion based on the current rates, what that would look like. And the initial phase of the project, um, we'd have to, you probably wanna confirm this with staff is the pricing was a little bit different, but any future connections would have to be discussed at that time. Okay, thank you, David. And just for clarification, I hear occasionally um, the, the anchor tenant, which is uh, Twin Anchors plant, because it is a plant and does burn so much wood and propane and the smoke is incredible in that little space in the wintertime in those trees and valleys and for the residents there. Um, this is actually gonna cost Twin Acres a little bit more to eat their plant from my understanding, but um, the smoke coming from the plant will be down to zero. So um, I'm glad that they signed up and uh, put their hand up to be a tenant client mm -hmm. to move forward with this, even though it was gonna cost them a little bit more. So. Th uh, thanks to them as well. Okay, anyone else have any questions? No? Thank you, David. We're good to go. Thank you very much. Have Thank a good day. you so much. Okay, moving forward. Bylaw enforcement presentation. John, District of Sycamus bylaw. Take it away, John. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor Council. I am here to, to sort of give a, a brief overview of the uh, bylaw enforcement department, how we receive complaints and uh, our process for handling them. Um, hold on. So complaints are received. Um, in phone or uh, in person, on the phone via email um, or through our online complaint form. I'd like to mention that the online complaint form is the best way uh, to send in information on a bylaw complaint because uh, it has all the questions that I need answered and I'm able to uh, assess and, and investigate immediately off of the online complaint form. So.
as with the uh, um, the Conservation Service, um, our primary focus is always education. Um, with the education, we uh, you know, attempt to get voluntary compliance before moving any in, do any forced actions uh, or requirements with the uh, property owners. Uh, of course, if education doesn't produce voluntary compliance, Pretty realistic looking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. If education doesn't produce voluntary compliance, we go to more of an enforcement action. Um, it's just sort of the procedure follows along as uh, industry here. We receive the complaint. I respond to the complainant and let them know that I'm looking into this the uh, their their issue. Investigate the address for any history. I like to do a site inspection. Um, and if the owner is there, uh, I do a knock and talk and do an initial education uh, speak, you know, uh, talking with them, issue, the, issue a letter detailing the contravention and a suggested timeline for compliance. Uh, after that, uh, depending on how conversations go, uh, issue a second letter. Potentially after that, further letters or other enforcement. Uh, and that other enforcement can include uh, ticketing, uh, civil action, or in, in most extreme cases, coming to council for remedial action. So the traffic sparks noise and some animal control com complaints are investigated on a priority basis during my patrols, um, because on those ones, the majority of those complaints require ticketing for enforcement. Um, and of course, under our current system, uh, MTIs uh, or our tickets have to be served individually, uh, which is uh, the way we've traditionally dealt with, especially with the parking issues. Um, I'd like to sort of address counsel on this, especially if you're receiving a complaint from the public or um, you would like information on any sort of sort of specific issue, please feel free to reach out to me um, or direct the public to the website for that online complaint form. Uh, you can also provide them my cell phone number uh, if it's something that is an urgent matter uh, that they want to talk to me about. Uh, thank you for listening to my quick presentation. If there's any questions. Yeah, we do have some. Councillor Rich, go ahead. Thank you, John, one, for doing this job. I know it's not an easy one, so we appreciate you tons. Um, my first question would be, what's the timeline for a complaint? So I email you or phone you and I say, whatever, my neighbor's dog's running up and down the road making me mad. Um, so how, how fast is a reaction time on that? Uh Depending on my shifts, unfortunately, because I, I only work five days a week, um, I, I normally respond to the complaints within 72 hours, uh, at least let them acknowledge that I've received the complaint. Um, depending on the severity of the complaint, um, I'm normally dealing with the owners or individuals involved by the end of the week. Um, so it's sort of five day, within five days of receiving it. So it's a, okay. It, I'm fairly good no, right I'm, now. Um, I mean, the caseload is still, I mean, it's building, but it's still small enough that I'm able to keep to that timeline. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, so what five days do you work? <laughs> uh, right so just now, to know. <laughs> right now I am uh, transitioning to the summer schedule. And I will be working um, Friday through to Tuesday, having Wednesdays and Thursdays off. And what are your hours? Um, for Fridays and Saturdays, uh, it's an afternoon shift into the late evening. Uh, so I start, I believe, at 3 o'clock, and I'll be on until 11.30. And Sunday through Tuesday, I remember correctly, it's 10 till 6.30. And if we can't get a hold of you, then where? who is our next step as a citizen, not me personally? Um, it would depend on the complaint. 
Uh, if it's an aggressive dog, I would recommend calling either conservation or the RCMP. Um, I'm not sure which one of these gentlemen. <laughs> Um, for <laughs> complaints in regards to burning or fires uh, or fireworks, you can contact the fire department or the RCMP uh, or conservation if it's up in the bush somewhere. So uh, the remainder of the complaints, while they may seem to be a priority to people, uh, they can be dealt with on a regular basis. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Bushell. Okay, thanks to the chair. Uh, thanks, John. Um, just a quick one. Have you, uh, now that we've implemented the short-term uh, rental bylaw, have you had any, uh, you know, any, a lot of traffic or is there a lot of calls coming in about it or anything like that? Um, I have received, I think I'm up to about 25 complaints on short-term rentals already. Oh my they gosh. primarily for people that haven't uh, got a license yet. We're, we are in our educational stage, uh, so I am not doing any enforcement on the actual rentals themselves, uh, just informing the owners of the property that they need to have a license um, and going through a letter writing campaign until at least I see an application come in for that property. Uh, we, when we do move to the enforcement um, side of things, uh, that will all give me that backup in case I have to go out and immediately start ticketing or, uh, you know, going for civil action to shut down a rental. Great, great. No, that's good. It shows that it's actually working. People are, are starting to call. And uh, of course, we've got lots of people signing up too. So that's yeah. good too. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Corey. Councillor Rich? Um, through the chair. Um, what is your usual time to deal with complaints. So if if I complain, like, does it take you two hours or five hours or nine hours? You're, you're working about 40 hours a week for summer hours and someone calls in for a short-term rental um, issue. From start to finish, how much do you put in for each in, in general? And I know that's maybe it's so those, need to get back to us for you mean the length of time I actually spend working on an individual complaint yes okay um in regards to short-term rental um I'm going to say it's about half an hour right now um and that primarily consists of checking the property files to find out if they've got an application in already um if they don't have the application and it's a pretty basic form letter that I'm sending out uh, with the details on an application package. Uh, once we move to the enforcement, I expect that that would be uh, a little bit more time for dealing with them, first checking for the license and then attending the site to deal with whatever issues have prompted the call, uh, be it noise or uh, fires, fireworks, uh, parking issues, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bailey. Um, just well, what's the order of priority? You obviously can't do it all. And so in the whole scheme of things, there's going to be complaints that are more useless than others, right? Uh, you know, where, where, you know, what are you kind of focusing on? In summer, is it like parking, bylaws, fractions, something more serious than? Um, during the summer, my primary focus is on uh, well, parks, animal control, and then uh, parking issues. Um, and then for other complaints or uh, such as property prop complaints on site, please, I deal with them on a regular basis as I'm in the office during that time. Uh, I do spend most of the summer out on patrol uh, rather than working in the office. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks. Go ahead, Scott. Thank you. Um, so maybe going back to the short-term rentals. So one thing John is doing is he's encouraging everybody to apply for a business license. So we are getting the business license applications from those properties that are complained about. However, probably the majority of the complaints are coming from one property and we simply can't issue business licenses right now. Um, so we have probably a dozen 
um, applications for business licenses um, out of those 25, but yeah, we're kind of waiting for some other things to line up. Um, um, then just added to John's hours from the past, we have had the, the bylaw ambassador. Um, so last year we had Sierra and she worked um, kind of the times John wasn't working. Um, so that'd be the, the Wednesdays and Thursdays where um, they, Sierra worked kind of the regular business hours um, and did a lot of patrols and, uh, you know, looked at the parks and issued a lot of parking tickets. So we'll probably look to continue that this year. Um, we'll be slightly reduced. We didn't get the funding we received last year, but we are looking at supplementing John's patrol with a bylaw ambassador. Um, so maybe this is a good time for um, the committee to give some feedback to myself and John on what you'd like to see or, um, this year um, as far as um, we can continue like we did last year. John, do you want to talk about what Sierra did last year and then, and then council the committee you can give some feedback to John on that as well? So for last year, the primary focus was on parks and traffic. In regards to the sort of loose animals, she would request people put animals on leashes, but we weren't ticketing for it at the time. Um, so there was no uh, real enforcement that we were doing at that for that. Um, beyond that, um, she uh, basically she just did patrols and uh, made her presence felt uh, to control the, especially the drinking uh, that was happening in the park last year. Kids jumping off the bridge, etc. Thank you, not Councillor Bailey. Yeah, I just kind of a follow up for what you said you. with the short term rentals. Is the um, so all the complaints are mostly coming from one source? Is that correct? Or one, let's say, building? Yeah, most most, most of our the legacy where we yeah. have people complaining about the legacy and and until their strata gets things. Nice. Yeah. Um, we can't issue any business licenses. So. Well, and that's what I was going to emphasize is that I think, you know, until the strata actually goes ahead and makes their rules, it, are we going to be, you know, saying if we are continuing to get these levels of complaints that are sucking up our resources when it should be the other way around, they should be figuring it out that we just park some of those complaints and not burden John with this ongoing kind of feud that's going on at the legacy. So go ahead, Scott. Maybe John, you want to talk about your strategy a little bit? Um, in regards to the legacy complaints, um, the only time I open an actual complaint file for them is if they haven't uh, applied for a business license. Uh, other than that, I just take the complaint. Um, yeah. I'm keeping files on each individual unit or once the legacy has finished their uh, discussions, uh, if we have to go to an enforcement stage, uh, then I've got the records of when the units were rented and, and the complaints that came from it. Great, thanks. Yeah, I, and, and I, I, I make this point just so that we're not here to solve building issue, right? And we've had them at council, we've talked about this issue, but I think that's really important for the integrity of the, the uh, short-term rental bylaw going forward is that it's used properly, not as a weapon against your neighbor that you may or may not agree with, depending on what's happening at the legacy So, uh, or, or in your condo. Um, just wanna make that point. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Paley. Thank you. Can I just ask uh, one question and it's to John and Murray. Um, now that we have our bylaw, uh, with no illicit drugs in our, our parks. And we have a specific list. So folks that are in those parks, according to bylaw police, there's no fines attached from this, just removal, correct? So how, how do you want the general public to deal with that? I think we would probably, the police would be the main point of contact for that, for people using in the park. And with the bylaw not having a fine, we're obviously not issuing a fine. We're just uh, telling people that they're in breach of the district's bylaw and that they can't be in the park and remove them at that time for, for the violation. Right. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to say for that one, when I am controlling the parks, um, if I do see people using illicit substances, I have been telling them not to do it in the park and moving them on. Um, I haven't been contacting the RCP regarding it. 
uh, because it's basically just been the, the occasional user and they've been really prompt to comply with leaving the parks. Okay. If you think that there's going to be pushback or it's not a complete, <laughs> I will be calling you. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It seems like a Councillor Bushel. Thank you, through the chair. Um, yeah, John, and maybe Scott. I just wonder about it. It's nice to have uh, when you're off because you got to take days off. But it, it would, I mean, it would be nice to have an ambassador again. And I know we didn't get the funding. Could we look at uh, the economic opportunity fund to just pop up a little bit to to get that? you know that staff member out there on those on your days off because it is it is good to have somebody in the community and it also has extra eyes for the rcmp as well and and i just just a thought anyways i don't know if that's if it's doable or not like we we did use that with uh our i guess that was johnny i guess we used our economic ec, ec, economic opportunity fund for johnny when we hired him so something to think about scott go ahead i think we do have we do have budget for it just not not as much as last year because we didn't get the, the funding from the, the, the federal government, but we we will provide the service. I think we're planning to just just probably not as robust as we did last year. Could there be a top up? Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, to that point, the the funding that we got was half of minimum wage, and we pay more than that in our environment, so it really doesn't have a massive material effect on the hours of that person. I think. Having somebody here is more important. So absolutely, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Council, anything? Go ahead, Council Rich. Through the chair. John, just to put you on the spot, um, if we could change or know something that maybe you need that we, because I know you and see you, but never ask that question. Um, that that is there anything we're missing that we should know about? Because you're the one on the street. Uh, right now I can't think of anything. Uh, Supply my my quarterly reports to Scott, who brings them to council. And that um, you know, there's there's no cases that are going any further than uh, my level at this moment. Once they do, I'll be bringing them to you in uh, in camera meetings. Thank you. Excellent. Anyone else? Thank you very much, John. Appreciate it. Okay, moving on. Um, okay, the bylaw, fence notice and bylaw. Bye, guys. Thank you. Adjudication system, John, you can uh, go ahead with that. <laughs> right after this commercial break. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I like myself a good flowchart. Yeah. Jeez, boy, that's not confusing at all. Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is what is that? Flowchart. <laughs> yeah. Something's flowing from the chart. Fire. Go ahead, John. Uh, Mayor Council, uh, prevent presenting an informational report in regards to adding. Uh, another level of enforcement to the bylaw department. Um, and this is moving away from MTIs or the municipal ticket information system to a bylaw offense notice system. Um, I'm sure if you've had a chance to read through the complete report, uh, but the, the main point of the switch from the one system to the other uh, is that uh, MTIs or the, the, what we're using right now are required to be personally served. Um, so with a lot of our uh, issues, especially regarding short-term rentals um, or unsightly properties where these the owners are out of town, um, it makes my job for enforcement really difficult because I don't have that extra tool. Um, to, with a little financial penalty to say, hey, we're serious, we want you to take care of this. Um, the uh, bylaw offense notices, of course, can be mailed uh, through standard mail. They're a valid ticket. Uh, received. 
couple of other points with them is a bylaw uh, offense notice. The uh, fine amount is limited uh, to five hundred dollars, so they'll be sort of they're they're not a very large ticket um, for these offenses. Uh, or even if we go to maximum, it's still uh, compared to what, especially in the case of short-term rentals, uh, what they're making off their properties uh, for these fines. So. Questions, anyone? Mr. McCabe. How much would the new system cost? To implement? Or to implement, yeah, to for the transition over and, and to get it up and running and, and annual operating cost? Um, for an annual operating cost, um, <clears throat> once we've applied through the Solicitor General, um, we can then apply to uh, join another other municipalities in the adjudication system. And that will depend on how many municipalities are in the same system um, or in the same group for that system. The my recommendation would be for us to join the uh, Southern Interior Group, uh, and our costs would probably be on the lower side of about $300, uh, up to about a maximum of $1,000 uh, to be part of the adjudication system. Annual? Uh, annual, yeah. And that's dependent on how many uh, disputes we get on the tickets, um, how many cases are, go are going to the adjudication. And in regards to that, if somebody disputes a, a ticket and it goes to the adjudicator and they deem them guilty, we are allowed to charge a $25 fee uh, to recoup some of those costs for the adjudicator. Um, and then in, in regards to the uh, actual tickets themselves, um, if I remember correctly, my purchase of MTI tickets last year was roughly a thousand dollars, so it would be about the same amount to get the MTI tickets. Councilor Bushel, to the chair, uh, the screening personnel that we would have to have. Uh, you guys thought about who we would have on the staff? Like, would it be somebody on staff, or would you have to have somebody new come in? Well. Um, there's actually two positions involved with the adjudication. So the first is a screening officer, and that would be somebody that's already on staff, um, either a, a manager or um, uh, any senior staff really can do that screening. And what the screening officer is looking for is, um, did the violation occur? Is the ticket filled out properly? And um, if it is, then it's a, it would be a valid ticket. Um, but they can also at that time, depending on uh, what the ticket is for, they could enter into a compliance agreement uh, with the, the, the individual that's been served uh, to require a certain thing be done um, and then void the ticket after that is done, uh, which is really good for the property offenses on site lease, uh, the short term rentals as well, uh, to make sure that those things get taken care of. Uh, then, then it would go to adjudication if they uh, wanted to continue. And uh, as I say, with the Southern Interior Group, um, court would be held in Bergen. So they would have to travel to Bergen or go to uh, uh, no, Thanks, John. I know I, I support the program myself. I think it's good. You know, Daryl's probably looking for some more work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Be the screening person. No, I'm just kidding. No. Thank you. Councillor Bailey. Yeah, so you're proposing that we add on the, the bond system on top of the MTI because or replace MTI with bond. Uh, what I'm proposing is actually adding it right. to the uh, MTI system. Uh, as I say, with the bond system, the fines are lower. Um, where we're getting into issues where uh, compliance uh, agreements or orders haven't assisted, we would then switch up to the MTI tickets, which are for a larger value. Um, and then following that, we come into council for uh, either legal action or remedial action orders. So my only concern that kind of crossed my mind on adding on the bond system is 
you know, are we then going to take that and then use it to issue more tickets? Um, is that something that happens with the system? Because maybe explain a little bit more um, there, how, how you think it's going yeah, to work. There, there will be no increase in the amount of units issued um, or a very minor increase. If I, I say one, once we move into some of the enforcement actions in regards to absent property owners, uh, because we haven't been, traditionally haven't been able to issue uh, tickets for those and have been relying on uh, other enforcement measures. Um, so there, there may be a small increase uh, in the amount of uh, tickets issued. But as I said, with uh, my previous presentation, education is and always will be my first priority. I would rather have people stop doing things voluntarily than forcing them to do things. So you like the bond system really allows you, you know, to have, you know, you have absentee property owners, you have a problem on that property, say, hey, you're not responding to me. We're going to issue a $200 fine and uh, that's going to go to you and then maybe I'll get your attention and then you'll comply. So that's kind of, it's just another lever to, let's say, get someone's attention. Absolutely, that's correct. Uh, and it, with a lot of the tickets that I have issued for property violations, once the owners have received those tickets, um, they, they agree to do what's required. And once it's finished, I normally void them. Uh, I haven't collected on very many property tickets at all. Uh, it's, as I say, it's, it's a tool rather than a punishment. Yeah, I, I'm certainly okay with another tool. I'd hate to see that we lean on that to increase fines, but I, I really appreciate your, your comments on that and your perspective because I think you know fines are all well and good. But if we do too many of them, then it becomes a, a you yeah. know like another issue. So yeah, thanks for those comments. Yeah, um, I have a quick question, John. The fines that you wrote, let's just take last year, and what's the percentage of those that we didn't collect? Um, out of the tickets that I wrote last year, I think we collected seventy five percent, maybe eighty percent of them. Very good. That's really good. Um, and out of that, the majority of them are paid early. Um, and there is, of course, reduced fine amounts for paying early. So it's, you know, it's, 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 so it's this, definitely a beneficial. Yeah. So maybe, yeah, maybe if there is, this is like going into a, a second step of complication. I feel like my personal opinion. I think if what we have right now is working that well and maybe we could tweak it to make it work better i and it's up to you guys i mean I'm, well it's up to us but what works for you guys but i think but from what i'm hearing we're doing pretty good so uh go ahead scott i think two advantages for the bond system is number one the mgi tickets are barely very vulnerable to challenge so if john or did issues those mtis and someone received one on the dash of their car and they decided they weren't going to pay them, for us to get that money would be very difficult and, and we might not get it if it went to court. And also John is then scheduling a court appearance in Salmon Arm for, to discuss one parking ticket and understand the resources it would take to, to do that. The bond system, it's, it's not as open to challenge so he can leave them on the windshield of the vehicle and not have to worry about losing in court. The other part is, instead of him scheduling a court for one parking ticket, they're all considered by that adjudication system. They're all considered. So all the tickets kind of in the Southern interior are considered on one day by one person. And they're just going through these, through the bond process and not the MTI process. So the two advantages are it's less open to challenge and more likely to be successful um, collecting the money. And then the second part is it's less time consuming because it's all of them are being considered on one day and John only has to go to that place one day a month or every two months and they're all dealt with on the same day by the, the same person. Um, if I could add a note to that, Scott, um, I, is, as part of the adjudication system, I am actually not actually required to go to the adjudicator to defend the ticket because they're there to look at the ticket 
and the evidence surrounding the ticket. So my photograph of the vehicle parked illegally, the ticket is correctly filled out, it's a valid ticket uh, versus um, taking an MTI to court. Then they look at uh, the bylaw and uh, the ticket and the pictures. And if there's even one tiny mistake on an MTI ticket, it's immediately thrown out of court. Unfortunately, it's very easy to make a mistake on a ticket, um, just even by forgetting to dot an I. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I guess my point was I I don't know if we have a big enough problem yet. Like I it looks like people are minding their P's and Q's. And if someone doesn't pay their ticket, the next time you see their vehicle, that plate, you put it, call it tow truck. And then people will continue to mind their piece. And I yeah, I guess I guess more of just maybe a bit more information. I'm just kind of on the fence with this one. So but good information. Councillor Bailey. Yeah, I'm kind of on the fence too. Um, we're not passing anything on this mm -hmm. today, right? We're gonna okay. Information. You know, my my thing about I guess I just have like I understand the system and I understand why it's it's a benefit. I have probably some problems with the screener system, like whoever that is, you can say, yeah, I love a ticket. You know, it's kind of a it's kind of an inside system works all in our favor maybe not for the person who's getting the ticket right so you know i have a little bit of a a fairness question in my mind about that and how it would actually work and how we're going to issue them and does this system eventually take over the mti system and now we're, because you know we're it's easier do we just flow things through more like that I, I often worry about the level of tickets that are being issued because I think the more tickets that get issued, probably, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I, I just don't like to lean on that. So I worry about these sort of systems because they kind of, I think, evolve and grow over time and they grow into something that we don't originally think they're going to grow into. So that's my reservation on that, on, on, on this. I, I think... If we had some clarity around what we're going to use bond for, right? Here's the class of tickets that we're going to use this for. So absentee property owners, all these other things, then I would have a little bit more comfort around it. I'd also like to know what our, our internal process would be, who's the screener and how we're going to deal with that. But, you know, overall, I, I like your approach that voluntary compliance is the way to go because I, I think that is where you we create a culture where people just want to do the right thing rather than us giving the camera. Um, so I, I'd like to see just maybe a list or a, a, like, a, like a short sort of suggestion of what we would use the bond system for versus the MTI system. Um, and, and I think if it's, if it's limited, then I think there's, there's a role for it, especially when it comes to as and thing. But if we're going to just do a whole bunch of short-term rentals through the bond system because we can't get a hold of you. I don't know. Like, I'm not totally comfortable that that would be the way that we're going to enact or try to uh, enforce our short-term rental thing. So I think it all kind of depends what we're using for it, is what I'm saying. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Bailey. Councillor Rich? Through the chair, um, how many times, say, in the last two years, have you had to go to court over a ticket? Uh... I've been to court over tickets seven times. Uh, one, I actually had to go to court three times for a single ticket, uh, just because of uh, various issues with uh, availability. Um, I've also had just recently dismissed some tickets um, as the property owner brought the property into compliance. Um, which were all, which were being challenged at the court, so uh, that's what took it. You know, it, um, it's, it, I can still cancel the ticket at any time and inform the court of such, and then then I don't have to go to the court, court for it. But we're losing you for that day. Like if you have to go to court, we've taken you out of our system. If I have entire to go to court, day. it's a minimum of four hours. 
I, you know, I like, I kind of agree with Councillor, I don't kind of, I agree with Councillor Bailey, I'd, I'd like to get more information, and I'd like us, we're, we're a community of 2,500 that grows into 10,000, yes, I understand, but for that number of people in the summer, I'd like a culture of compliance, I'd like a culture that, you know, and maybe education as opposed to, you know, um, they're going to court for, you know, so I, I think just more information from for me anyway. So, but I, we're not making any decisions here today. But maybe we can have a conversation. Any other questions, Council? Good. Thank, thank you, John. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Parks and Trails Master Plan presentation. Steffi, Assistant Planner. Thanks, Steffi. Floor is all yours. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, so we started working on this Parks and Trails Master Plan around the same time last year as the Active Transportation Network Plan. And the public engagement process for both of these projects was done at the same time as well. This part of the master plan will act as a planning tool to direct and guide the management of parks and trails within Sycamus. And our vision statement was derived from the public engagement process. Um, and our vision statement is to protect, maintain, and enhance existing parks, trails, and facilities, and plan for future parks and trails while facilitating all season use and improved accessibility for all ages and abilities. And this was derived from uh, the different public engagement activities like surveys, uh, focus groups, pop-up events, uh, open houses, et cetera. So this master plan would contain the following information, um, a section uh, on a summary of the study of existing policies and guidelines that is focused on parks and trails, new park classification system, Park supply and inventory of parks and trails, recommendations and priority projects, summary of public engagement events, and an updated parks and trails map. So for the public engagement, um, we had a diverse range of activities between June and August 2022 to gather feedback from the community on their parks and trails usage, what are the challenges, experiences, goals, recommendations, etc. A total of 12 engagement opportunities were provided um, that included community surveys, online and paper format, online interactive map, high school focus group, open houses, and pop-up events. We had a total of 144 survey responses. Um, and some of the common themes in the survey was that more than half of the respondents use parks and trails regularly. However, they get these information through word of mouth and not through any um, documents or websites. Concerns with lack of connected system of trails um, to parks, downtown schools, and other points of interest within town, like um, sidewalks or trails stop abruptly, it's not continued. Um, need for safe highway crossing, better signage, and defined routes, and a need for maintenance and improvement of existing parks and trails. And a detailed report on these responses from different public engagement events is added as an Appendix A to the report today, to the agenda. And this, um, my presentation back to the Committee of the Whole is form of the last um, public engagement factor is bringing the draft report back, back to the public for their comments, and then we'll work on it and then publish the final uh, first and foremost master plan. The next section explores existing parks sub, um, supply uh, for Sycamus by evaluating the existing park plan and if that meets the needs and requirements of the current and future. From the big scale of regional parks to the intimacy of small parks, everything is connected to everything else. So although in terms of scale, the function of these parks could be different, but the community value is still the same. As you can see on the screen, this is the proposed new classification system because um, we didn't have a park classification system uh, in our previous parks bylaw. And this matches with our current needs while also being flexible um, for the changing demographics. 
It will also guide in park asset management um, and to deliver both active and pa passive park um, services. The first one being community recreation parks. Um, these are usually destination parks that serve the needs of the local community as well as visitors. It usually offers a diverse range of services from athletics to recreational opportunities for all people and ages. Um, it can also host tournaments and other community events. So two parks within this, this classification is MJ Finlayson, Centennial Park and Dog Park. The next one uh, is waterfront parks and walkways. These are the parks that provide access or views to the shores of Shuswap, Mara, and Eagle River. And these provide opportunities for water-based activities like swimming, canoeing, picnicking, kayaking, etc. Um, natural parks is similar to conservation parks. Um, these are intended to protect and preserve the significant natural or cultural features. And these, um, for these parks, additional studies need to be done before going forward with any development. Road right of way, walkway, beach access. These are the road right of way that is currently used as an open space with or without ornamental landscaping and seating. <laughs> Some have access to beach with opportunities for activities like picnicking and swimming. Neighborhood parks service um, the immediate neighborhood within 400, um, 800 meter radius. And pocket parks are passive park spaces. Uh, we currently have just one uh, pocket park, which is the Memorial Park outside um, the school. And these are very essential uh, passive spaces and intended like for socializing, having a lunch, taking a break, etc. Greenway trail system. Um, these are the Sycamus Greenways. Um, are small trails connecting different neighborhoods and places of interest. And then the next one is trails which includes all the other trails within Sycamus and others include um, golf courses, school playgrounds, etc. Next, coming to the park supply. Um, so the District of Sycamus has 38.25 hectares of developed and undeveloped parks. Um, this is not including the road right of ways and beach access. Although the total area um, of these parkland appears to be significantly more, but the way it's distributed and the park services is not adequate. Um, next is park distribution. So we calculated um, one is population based uh, parkland distribution, and then one is spatial distribution, just understanding how the parks are distributed within different neighborhoods. Um, spatial analysis was uh, done to understand the distribution of these parks uh, based on the approximate distance that a resident walk. Um, for example, um, taking 20 minute walk for um, community recreation, waterfront parks, and then 10 to 15 for neighborhood parks. Based on the survey, 57% of the respondents felt that sidewalks or pathways that get to their destinations were incomplete or sometimes did not exist. So some of the factors that discourage people uh, from walking or biking around town was either lack of rest areas or not having enough shade, inadequate lighting, especially in winters, and speed and noise of the motor traffic. Um, also, one major factor being highway going through the town, creating a major disconnect between different neighborhoods. Um, Parks and facilities, especially for pedestrian, bike, and other non-motorized vehicle users. The next section is park inventory. So we have um, an inventory of all the parks with some details on um, location, area, play equipment, activities, parking, and other features. And in some cases, some park specific recommendation based on survey responses. And that is a list of all the parks. Next, we have trail section, um, which is a detailed inventory of the existing trails in and around Sycamus, and also a list of proposed trails as well. Coming to the recommendation. Um, the projects are categorized into three timeline categories, um, short, medium, and long-term. Short being one to three, medium being three to seven, and long being seven plus. Uh, the first section being bylaws and policies. Under that, we have a couple of short-term 
projects. It's not working. Thanks. Updating parks bylaw number 393 to reflect the current parks and new classification. Um, the next one is updating community connectivity map within the OCP, adding some guidelines and policies either within the parks bylaw or traffic bylaw for canopy protection and management of trees uh, within park spaces and public realm. Reviewing the existing guidelines and policies related to um, the same street tree protection. Also including some design guidelines for park spaces within OCP, uh, which is focused on universal design and septic principles. Next medium term goal is to include climate change strategies along with the park design guidelines. Um, this would include same canopy protection and management of street, which is also um, helpful with urban heat management as well. Um, the next recommendation is to consider uh, public green infrastructure um, as part of the housing strategy to offset increased density. For example, contributions to the neighborhood parks, services, trails, instead of parkland dedications. Some other recommendations um, are educational awareness, wayfinding and signage, uh, blue waste paddle trailer project. I can talk a bit about each of these recommendations. Educational awareness is um, it includes um, creating handouts or having online platforms to talk about invasive species within our communities. Also working in partnership with recreational programs and school district to promote and raise awareness of existing parks and trails, locations, special features, and health benefits related to the use of trails. Wayfinding and signage, um, uh, with our survey responses, um, they express the need for better wayfinding signs around town showing public parking spaces, trail connections, public boat launch, local businesses, and other places of interest. So the recommendation here is to work with um, Shuswa Trail Alliance and Sycamus Development Corporation to create a wayfinding strategy for Sycamus. Blue Waste Paddle, Paddle Trail Project, um, DOI has, has previously worked with CSRD and Shuswa Trail Alliance on this project to create a Blue Waste map. The purpose of this map was to identify some key entrances and exit um, along the areas of Eagle River and Shuswap Lake for kayaking, paddle boarding, and canoeing. And the recommendation is to continue working on this project to identify the existing hand launch areas and potential locations that could serve as a hand launch access points. Um, some of the other recommendations include programming and design of undeveloped parks, um, a better beach park design to deal with high water issues and closures to community activities, trail improvement and connected greenway trail system, and collaboration with heritage designation. So collaboration with heritage designation is actually um, a partnership between, we're proposing a partnership between Old Sycamus Highway Trail and Brown House because the Brown House is already going through a heritage designation. So thinking about the possibilities of combining these two um, and yeah, opportunities to connect the existing Old Sycamus Highway with the Brown House um, heritage designation. Um, the last recommendation being winter design parks, um, investigating ways to integrate existing park features for winter activities and exploring funding opportunities for the same. That's the end. Awesome, thank you, Steffi. Council, any questions for Steffi? Councilor Beach. Steffi, thank you. Um, this is, this is uh, I remember coming to the very first uh, meeting uh, and not expecting all of, all of the discussion and the sharing of everything that we have. And this is very exciting. Um, I guess um, the only question I do have, I do remember outstanding because I'd never really thought about it that much myself was, was uh, a comment from Councillor Bailey about um, needing more winter parks. So, um, and then, you know, looking at all of the feedback from the community, because you've, you've done a good, you know, you've, we've put it out there and we've had a fair chunk of feedback. Uh, it stuck with me that there were a number of concerns about icy 
I see walking and getting exercise in the winter time. So I'm throwing it out there like a broken record. Um, where can we have a, a winter park that enjoys winter, but has safe safety? And I know where we could, but I'm just noting that. That was the one piece that I think we still haven't addressed winter parks and safe exercise and walking in the winter time. So thank you though, yeah. it was. I can add to that comment because we did talk about winter parks and then we, I think we talked about oh, focusing on one park like before the next winter. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's possibility um, for winter activities in the beach park and also the um, Finlayson park. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. No, uh, go ahead. I just want to respond to that because I've lived for years on yeah. Finlayson Park since it was it was developed into a walking path and and we've had we've had lots of broken hips and we've had some accidents on that on those trails. No matter how hard we try to keep them, they they under the right wrong conditions, right wrong conditions, um, it still is you have to be so um Anyways, yeah, so that was that was my sort of thing that came to mind for that. Thanks, Councillor Reeds, Councillor Bailey. Um, yeah, I'm a pretty big fan of this report. I have some questions around canopy protections and management, but I can wait for another time. Um, I, I think the I think the challenge with this report is how we're going to action it. And, you know, we talked about this at planning and development that I, I was even surprised about some of the properties that we have and potential uh, for those properties to actually become, you know, activated really and, and, and for the community to start using them to their full potential. And I think where we are now is we have a fairly comprehensive inventory and an idea of what's possible. And now it comes down to what does council want to do with it? And I mean, I would really like us to at least have one project a year where we're doing something and we got, you know, recreation and uh, trails or, or something that we're adding to. And I think we already have a couple of those projects going on, but it's just something for us to think about. And, and I mean, the one I would like to just put up there that I think we could action pretty quickly is that, you know, canoe and um, stand up, you know, paddleboard launch and things like that because we actually do have the property and so there there's some things that are within our means right now that i think we can do that would add a lot of benefit to the community and it's an amenity um but i i just want to commend that i think this was a very important project I'm very happy with it and i think it gives us a really good roadmap and i just want to make sure this doesn't you know stay on the shelf and i think everyone is committed to implementing it um but yeah thanks again <clears throat> councillor mccabe yeah thank you through the chair yeah great report um it's good to have a document like that for sure um a couple of comments dog park I, I go there quite a bit um sometimes parking is full there because people use it for uh non-motorized boat launching like kayak launching and people park there to uh stop unload their bikes and then go bicycling down to Old Town Bay and back. And people park there for dogs. So um, for no special reason, I've seen parking full there without a, any event or anything, right? And it would be easy to um, increase the parking, easy and cheap, uh, just extend the fence line further. Uh, well, not extend the fence line, but just add some more parking, just a little bit of fill and some more parking heading Heading south, I guess. Okay. Um, it wouldn't be very expensive to fill it in and just add a little bit more parking. And then, of course, the fencing in the, down by the new bridge there in the in the north uh, northwest corner. It's already landscaping everything down there. I know you tie the fence into nothing, but uh, it would stop the dogs from running up in the road. They might get into the bush, but. Just depends on it wasn't in recommendations in the dog park section. So okay. a couple of cheap fixes there. Um wayfinding signs. Uh, part of our community is um, a retirement community. Staff Canada shows that about I think it's 
55% of our community is seniors. Uh, I've seen some graphs show that uh, if, if you go from uh, 55 and above, we're, we're at over 60% uh, population of 55 and above. Um, so the wayfinding signs that are currently out there have very small font and for seniors walk along the paths and stuff. Um, there's two, and no disrespect to all the effort that Gord's put into those signs, the recreation, but um, there's too much information on one post and it, the fonts are too small to be useful, functional, uh, in my opinion. I think we need to get a bigger fonts and less messaging on each sign somehow. Yeah. And, Need you to be critical when you're not doing it. <laughs> Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, Gord, before I take and uh, Siobhan, uh, Daryl, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Yeah, through the chair, just quickly on the fence by the bridge. Uh, that is scheduled. It's on the list. There are some defects that have to be cleaned up at that bridge before we do that. Right. And the parking, we did extend it already to the north. We've got three extra spots. So that ditch line has been filled in and there, it is wider than it was last year. To the north? Yeah. Yeah, I think maybe now to the south. You're looking at it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And thanks for looking after that dog park. We did get a complaint not that long ago of a visitor whose dog she let go in the dog park and it got out onto the highway. So it's need to, that's perfect. Okay, go ahead, Gord, Council Pusho. Sorry. Yep, through the chair. Uh, great job, Steffi. I, I really think this is a great, uh, great uh, document. Like you say, Ian says, I hope it doesn't sit on the We do have a lot of really easy, easy projects we could knock off this year by, like to say, opening up the canoe park and, and maintaining it, you know, taking the chain down and and uh, getting it used. And there's lots of these little parks that we have and and uh, and just get the public, you know, get the public involved and, and reviewing it themselves. Um, I know uh, Shoot Rob Trail Alliance, uh, we partnered with them on the wayfinding signs and we never did finish that to a point where there was supposed to be kiosks and uh, um, part of the MRDT funding can go towards kiosks and I know Carly's got it on the list and that would be a big help if we could get three or four big kiosks yeah, like they have in Salmon Arm and you know the Sushwamp Trail Alliance and, and the CSRD uses nice kiosks in some of their parks and then also ties in all the trail systems so yeah it, uh, we got lots of work to do, and uh, there's some really easy, easy wins uh, that we could do this year. And uh, I just think you guys did a great job. Thanks very much, Scott, and the, your team. Go ahead, Steffi, and then. Respond to that. Um, I did talk to Carly regarding the wayfinding signage, and we're hoping to find uh, funding to create that strategy. Because uh, if we are able to create that strategy, that would include a hierarchy of different signage and wayfinding for cyclists cater to um, seniors, um, like the legibility of the signs and stuff like that. So. Perfect, thanks, Steffi. Perhaps the race. Through the chair, um, again, great report. I really enjoyed it. I love that you guys included the schools in it. I think that like we kind of hit, you guys, we, no, I'm not included in the week, uh, the Royal Week, um, hit like, I love that the schools were involved with in, in that. I am wondering too, when we talk signage, is there a possibility that Sigmas can start, especially with parks, putting our QR codes on stuff. Because that is, when I go into a restaurant, I scan it, and that I can walk up to a trail and put my phone up and then see where all my trails go to and how it works. Instead of, and then I've got it in my phone and then I can work my way through Sigmas. That would be amazing, but not sure. But yeah, I could add that as far as the right. But for future, if we're looking forward, it's, uh, it's a huge, yeah. um, you know, something that maybe we can start involving when we're looking at our signs, because that's kind of how the world's working now that I can, you know, and I'm old. So if I can do it, Mel seniors can do it. <laughs> no, I don't know. Okay. Somebody read you. Oh, I'm okay. Are you good? Yeah. Um, sorry, Councillor McCabe. Yeah, just follow up on Councillor uh, Rich's comment. Um, Enderby is using a QR code yeah. for uh, Enderby Cliff. So you go up to the uh, uh, a certain portion of the path up the Enderby Cliffs, you do the QR code and it'll explain uh, the significance of where you are and what's going on around you sort of thing. Um, I think that could solve the font issue for seniors. I mean, even seniors are learning how to use these. Mm -hmm. uh, like I've, I've learned 
I got it. Mm -hmm. A few waitresses like bring me a menu, please. Well, sir, it's right there. Why are you? <laughs> so I learned to use it. <laughs> um, I I just want to say that QR I, just to build on what you're basically saying is that in QR codes, not only could we give more direction, we could give history, right? And so I do believe that coming out of Together Shushwap, there was an actual project that a group took on to put QR codes and Indigenous history on signage all through the area. Now, I don't know how, if that actually was completed, but you could use QR codes to put history, to like history on as well. So, right. Thanks. Councillor Bailey, did you have something else? No. Anyone else? QR codes and larger fonts. I don't, you know what? We can attach these. We can attach these. Yeah. So you walk up, you just use these, and then you just leave them. Might be less expensive. Less expensive option. Just just saying. Scott. I just want to thank Steffi for all her hard work. Um, I think I, I recognized, you know, pretty early when I got here that we needed an inventory and something like this. And I tasked Steffi with it and didn't give her much <laughs> instruction or not a whole lot of help and resources along the way. And she just took it and ran with it. Wow. Awesome. Thanks, nice yeah. Steffi. Steffi, thank you very much. Great job. Thank you. Okay. Moving along, housing strategy implementation, secondary dwelling units, and gentle infill. Scott, development services manager, <laughs> take it away. <laughs> there you are. Uh, this was originally Sarah Martin's presentation, but uh, Sarah had an emergency today and, and couldn't come in. So uh, this morning, I realized that I was going to make the presentation. Um, I think there is a slideshow. The same one, but um, as you know, the housing strategy was uh, was adopted by council in February of 2023. So um, this is the the next step to implementation of that uh, that housing strategy. Um, and really, today it's for the committee to consider the OCP and zoning amendments to implement the, the housing strategy, and um, and then give any feedback now, and then we can bring this back to the zoning amendments and the OCP start some of the, the public consultation. Um, so this uh, this presentation, I believe the the housing committee and the planning development committee have already seen it and uh, and both of them have uh, provided their blessing for it to, to come to the committee as a whole. Um, so these are the housing strategies. So strategy 1.1, enable diverse housing types and uh, strategy 3.1, promote potential infill, and then to achieve those strategies, um, some changes to the, the bylaws are required. Um, so the, the short-term actions are to update the R1 zone and some of the residential use policies, and, uh, and then update the residential land use designations to allow for the, the infill, um, the increased infill. So one of the big parts of this is amending the R1 and the OCP to allow for gentle infill and it's like what is dental infill and it's adding um, you know in the existing neighborhood you can see the the two like you know often called laneway houses or or skinny houses um you know in a, in a residential zone um top right that's like a, a triplex that you know you drive by you might think it's a single family dwelling but it actually houses three families and then in the one on the bottom right i think that might be like a six place where they've actually taken you know, you know, your traditional really big house and uh, and garage and converted it to, to house, you know, six families instead of just, just one family. Um, so that's what gentle infill could look like. I think if you drove around uh, Sickmoose, I think uh, Sarah's planning on taking the housing committee um, around uh, around Sickmoose, and there's actually a couple of them that you're driving by and, and you don't even realize that there's a second dwelling there. They're, they're actually fit in well. So I, I think it's a, a really good way to look at gentle infill, um, particularly in the, the free streets areas where the, the properties are a bit bigger. Um, so this is the, the current R1 zone, what uh, what the secondary suites could look like, um, you know, a, a duplex or a house with something in the basement um, with the new zoning bylaw, it allows those detached suites where people can have something in the backyard. 
Um, you can see panhandle lots where you know someone's subdividing where their driveway is and giving access to their backyard or their front yard and you get a dwelling in there. Um, and then uh, just the other ones where um, you're creating the smaller lots, creating smaller parcel sizes and just getting more density. Um, and, the, and the goal is four units per parcel. And that's actually, everybody remembers recently, the province uh, announced that they, they wanted the goal of four units per, per parcel. Um, and really, um, we were already working on it. So um, we might be one of the, the leaders in the province on uh, on getting this uh, getting this in place. Um, so the zoning bylaw amendments, um, just some tweaking to the the zones um, to allow for higher density. Uh, one is definition of flow area, and it's like moving basements right now. Basements uh, is included in the floor area, so when you're looking for that increase in the percentage, um, it, it means you don't get as much by, by removing basements from that calculation. Uh, we should be able to uh, encourage more suites. Um, tweaking the definition of secondary suites, uh, and then again with the density. So right now it's it's uh, two uh, dwelling units per parcel. We increase that to four dwelling units per parcel, and then uh, some rules and regulations um, just just implementing those in the in the zoning bylaw. Um, and then the OCP amendment. So in addition to the universal de design principles, um, and then um, adding, updating. So section three um, talks about um, when the OCP was done in 2016. Talks like you know has a little preamble of what uh, what the existing situation is in Sycamore. So updating that with some current numbers, but then also adding in the housing targets from the, the housing needs assessments and the housing strategy, adding those into the, the official community plan. So. When this council or future council is looking at the policies, they can say, hey, these are our targets and, and let's work towards them. Um, and yeah, expanding the medium density residential zone, that's a that's a pretty big one. Um, and then in the future, um, looking at as of right zoning, which would be um, kind of a, an idea that even though you're not zoned for it, you have the, the room to do it and you can just move forward with the project and not have to go through the rezoning. But that, that's kind of a, a future idea, but um, definitely the, the medium density zone expanding that zone will provide that opportunity in the future. Um, <clears throat> Sarah likes to say it's, it's sprinkles. It's, it's, you're not gonna have like some big project. So the, the picture in the middle is kind of what it would look like. There's, you know, say that's Rama Crescent or the tree streets. And you just, you know, you add something here and something there and slowly you increase that density with uh, different building types. That you see in this drawing. The top left, I think, is a triplex. So they have, they'd have you know, a unit in the basement, a unit in the middle, a unit on top. But you see that something like that would, uh, would fit in just about anywhere in, in Sycamore. Sorry, that was an emergency. Okay. Okay. No, it was an emergency. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Nobody get up and ran out of the room. No, we're going to end that one. <laughs> Coming down fire. Yeah. No, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, so this is the current medium density uh, designation is the purple, and the proposal would be to you see the, the difference where you're going from kind of just on the uh, west side of Highway 97 and then actually um, increasing the area for medium density residential, um, basically in, in all the traditional R1 zones, and uh, and that would bring you up to the the four units per. Uh, Per parcel, and um, yeah, that's the end of my presentation or Sarah's presentation. Um, but obviously, the next step would be um, bring this to council and then doing the the public consultation part. Um, <coughs> Councillor McCabe and Councillor Rich are on the, the housing committee, so they might be able to answer some of the questions as well. Um, but yeah, I think you know this is a, a pretty quick turnaround from you know having the Straightening the housing committee and then having the housing strategy. And then now we're moving quickly with the, the next steps. And uh, and yeah, hopefully, you know, aiming to reach those those housing targets that uh, have been identified as a as a need in the community and, and also keeping up with the province with uh, you know the their mandates that are coming forward. Good. Thank you, Scott. Council, any questions? Councillor Beach and Councillor McCabe. Um yeah, no, I I I think it I think it's great the infill idea is is great. Um, I have a question and maybe I've just missed it. 
Um, when we talk about housing, I mean, I always look at the downtown development as well as a potential place for housing and revitalizing downtown by bringing people living above businesses. And I, I, if I missed it, because I missed it, if it's addressed in here, have we addressed that idea of trying to encourage um, new builds in our downtown area to be able to go up a level and put housing above? Because right now the buildings can't there, right? They don't have the foundation. Go ahead, Scott. I can speak to that. Um, so uh, the new zones, like the C1 and the C2 zone, they, they do allow for multifamily, um, so commercial on the bottom and then multifamily units on top. And usually when people come in and they're looking to do development, so an example would be the um, the dairy by the, the Chevron. When they came in, they yeah. they had an idea and they, they wanted to do the dairy clean. And, and I think it was very simple for us to say, you know what, you're going to be allowed to put units on top it could, could help you with, because workers okay. obviously an issue and could help you with getting your workers in. And they, they jumped on that. And uh, so definitely um, something that uh, is has been implemented in our, our zoning and um, yes, it will be encouraged. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I just, I just wondered if we needed incentives to get people to think that way or not, so. Councilor McKay. Thank you. Yeah, just two comments on, on, yeah, I think businesses are recognizing that in the service industry that you need to accommodate your employees or you might not have a business. I think a and is doing that in town. At Beach Chicks, they have some accommodation in the back for their seasonal employees. Um, uh, Best Western is doing that with their new development. I, I think it's just the way, not just in Sycamus, but uh, it, in our housing crisis, I think businesses are recognizing that. And I, I just wanted to say that this was brought to the planning, you did mention that, but this was brought to the planning committee and the planning committee uh, did endorse it, support it. So, uh, and yes, um, I'm very pleased. And, uh, it took about eight months with the housing committee and then into uh, council and the planning committee and, and uh, the, uh, this can get endorsed by council. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, sorry, Councilor Bailey, go ahead. All right. Just a couple of things. I brought it up at planning and development, and I asked Sarah the question about the surface areas or the maximum amount of buildable area. I think you have it pegged at what, 40 or 60%? I can't remember. And I wonder if we should be looking at increasing that maximum buildable area on a lot. And I know her answer to me was, you know, we really you haven't really encountered that yet. But if, if I'm thinking about it as we go forward and we're going to be trying to have these lots eventually go up to four units or even maybe more, maybe, maybe we do want to get five plexes on there, whether we should be limiting the floor or the, the buildable area to that low or whether we should be giving ourselves a little bit of uh, Extra wiggle work. I'll leave that with you to think about it, but that's something I want to highlight. Um, the other thing is, and I brought this up at planning and development too, is for us to map out where we actually have the sewer, water capacity, and all of these things so we can, um, you know, target those areas or we can find people who want to invest in these types of developments to direct them there, right? Um, I, I think. The problem with the EB kind of just blanket, you know, four units on every lot, let, let it rip, is it just doesn't work that way. I mean, electricity doesn't work that way. Water, sewer, it doesn't work that way. There's finite capacities to all of this. But if we can actually identify within our systems where we do have slack or if we have slack, um, then we might be able to encourage developers or homeowners that are kind of looking for that property to kind of do that in the future. So I, I think that would be useful. But I don't think every area of town would be in the same, and maybe maybe I'm wrong on that, uh, not every area of town would have the same capabilities when it came to water, sewage, and you know, electrical capacity. So having it um, kind of mapped out what, what does and what we can actually upsize pretty quickly, would, I think would be helpful. Oh. Do we get a lot of inquiries, Scott? Like, 
folks looking to build carriage homes or secondaries or expanding their housing on their property? Is there a lot of calls for that? Do we get a lot of calls? I think most people are looking at something in their home, like like a, a basement suite, right? That's kind of the, the first thing people think of. But we are we are getting yeah the the ideas of the, the carriage homes and, and things like that. And um, another project that Sarah's working on is looking for a partner uh, to come up with a, a you know designed and ready to go plans mm -hmm. for for a carriage home. Um, so she's looking at actually, you know, having a set of plans here that someone can come in. I mean, here's five designs for carriage homes that, you know, have been approved by the building official. They'll fit on most lots in Sigmus and uh, and partner somebody to offer that out to people. So yeah, Sarah's definitely part of that. That's a really good idea. Councillor yeah. Bailey. Um, yeah, just building on. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me of the other questions. Can we get fourplex designs? Like, is that something, I mean, we're, we're trying to get units on these R1 residentials. Should we be trying to say, here's a quick path to build a four unit home? Is that something you guys have thought about? I, I don't think we're looking at fourplexes. Um, and, the, and it gets tricky with each property's difference. So I think right. a fourplex, you know, it's going to be slightly more complex and um, yeah, really, really site specific. Um, you know, if you had a quarter acre lot, you want to put a fourplex, um, and we had a bunch of vacant quarter acre lots, it might make sense to do that. Um, but I think this, um, the project Sarah's working on is really just looking at, you know, that, that carriage house, that, that unit that can fit in most backyards where we, we know there's, there's space and, and, you know, people might be open to that idea. Um, as soon as you start building gets bigger, adding more units, the site starts to have more strains. More question. Um, and I, I brought this up before and uh, Councillor McKay just touched on it is about um, commercial properties wanting to have space for workers or seasonal workers. I, I fall in that category, obviously. You know, why can't we have separate staff accommodations on properties that would allow it? And this sounds a little self-serving because I actually have that ability. Um, and it's something we're I'm going to be looking at as the years go forward. But there seems to me like there's a lot of commercial properties with possible awesome lands that they own already where they could be actually adding in housing. And some of our zoning just doesn't allow it. And and I think we should look at that because I think that's going to help anytime we get housing built anywhere. I think is a good thing in this town, right? Whether it's on a commercial lot that we allow because they want to solve their staffing problems or it just becomes part of what's expected, right? On a seasonal business. And we are such, an, such a seasonal town that you do have to offer some people those seasonal accommodation. But I think then that can turn into something that's helping alleviate some of our housing problems overall, right? Um, and, and I think there's a lot of commercial properties in town that could fall into that category where there's space to allow housing, but the zoning doesn't necessarily allow that. Like we've had that one where, you know, the seat frontage road, they had to get special permission to put a house or a, a trailer there and now going through, through others. Why don't we just kind of figure out a way to allow this in siting permits and all these other things that we have to do? Uh, but to kind of activate those sites that we're encouraging housing to be built. And that, so I guess that's my other my comment um, that I think there's some possibility there in town. Thanks. Councillor Bishop. Okay. Yeah, the chair, yeah, all good points. Uh, I just want to do, you know, thank Scott and his team and, and all the people that put this together. There's a lot, a big group of people that put this together and uh, just, you know, really appreciate all their time and every, and effort to, to get us where we are today. So yeah, it'd be nice to get this uh, approved and passed for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, council? All good. Scott, thank you very much. Great presentation. Okay. Moving forward, Silver Sands Road Railway Railway Crossing, CAO Bennett, do you want to take it away? Oh, yes. Uh, 
Most definitely. Okay. <laughs> Share this is just a really quick update, just giving everybody the heads up. So as part of, so we have two crossings, one at Hillier Road and uh, one at Silver Sands. Uh, you will notice there was some postings that we had them closed because they the CP was doing their inspections. Um, so when doing their inspection, they noticed uh, there was some work that needed to be done on the Silver Sands crossing specifically. Uh, maybe Daryl can speak to the, the details of it because he was there on the inspection. Um, and we have a contract with uh, CP as the, the road, uh, the railway was there and then we wanted to cross it. So we have a road that crosses. We have a crossing agreement saying that, you know, that we have to pay monthly to cross that, the town does, and that we pay for any maintenance or repairs on that crossing. So uh, they are closing that crossing for a, a period tomorrow, May 11th. Uh, and there will be a charge, we'll get charged for the repairs and they're estimating those repairs to be around $150,000. What? Yes, so they're quite, we're not being billed for them this year. They will go into next year's financial plan. Uh, so we'll see what it ends up by costing, but they did give us a range and we don't really have much choice in it. Um, the good news is, is the Hillier Road Crossing is good to go. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I don't know if Daryl has anything else to add on that, but I just wanted to give everybody the heads up. Yeah. Thank you. Daryl, do you have anything? Through the chair, I did meet on site with Nicole and, and uh, the rep from CP. Uh, he did an assessment and he showed us a couple of signs that were weathered and old and he showed us a little bit of broken concrete. And I really can't think of too much else that I saw that wasn't safe. Sure. It just, it seemed like a lot. <laughs> we don't have, you know, we don't have the ability to go out and do it ourselves. It's, it's their crossing. They were there first. So uh, they told us what it'll cost. And I, I guess they're coming tomorrow to do it. Okay. So I guess there's not a lot we can do about that. We just sit tight and wait to see what happens when the bill comes. Well, I have a comment on it. Yep. I mean, $150,000 for, I'd like to, I mean, it'd be nice. I mean, do they give us a work plan or a scope of work? Why they say it's $150,000? Or they just say, hey, give me 150 grand and have a nice day. After the chair, do you remember seeing anything formalized in terms of a layout? It was much beyond the concrete. And is that including any fencing or that's down the road with the whistle thing? Yeah. So I would like staff to request detail of what the $150,000. I think that's reasonable. We're going to pay that. I'd like to at least say to taxpayers, by the way, this is what CP charged us and here's what we got. I mean, obviously CP, we have a crossing agreement so that binds our hands a little bit, but at the very least, mm -hmm. they should be saying, here's why it costs 150 grand and the justification of it. I don't think that's unreasonable at all for us to ask, so. No, and I kind of assume that you guys had that, but you don't. We don't have, we have a ballpark estimate. We gave you what they're going to do. So there is a, a, a ballpark of the work that's going to be done. Well, but not itemized and no, yeah, no, like no. I, I think they need to give a bill. Yeah. Correct. So when when they've they've confirmed they're not going to bill us until next year and we'll request a detail. Right. I mean, you want to know what we're paying for. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I yeah. Councillor Rich. Through the chair, um, I'm wondering, have we ever had to pay for work on the crossings before? And is it something that we should be looking to add into our budget? Like, is it kind of a 10 year thing or a five year thing? Like it's, you know, like I know I'm gonna change the oil in my car every couple months and then I need winter tires. Is it something that we can kind of project? Or like, have we ever had an issue before with this? Through the chair, I don't recall ever paying a bill for any repairs at any of the intersections. I know the one on, uh, on Salt Square Road, I, I think we paid most of the, the arm costs for that. Mm -hmm. That was yep. their decision to do that. We knew it was coming. Uh, I'm not sure what their schedule is and, and what kicks off, you know, immediate work, but they looked at that intersection and said, oh, we could do that one quickly. So they're here already. So hard to plan for, but maybe a little reserve for that in, in the future. Mm -hmm. We have, yeah, contingency on roads, though, too. So, um, Councillor Bushel. 
Yeah, through the chair, I, I agree with Ian. It's a, a breakdown would be uh, for sure. You know, when you're talking about a 3% tax increase uh, for next year, and uh, and like maybe we should maybe reach out to Pam and Aaron and Golden and just say, what do you guys, what do you guys do? Or even the CSRD, you know, do they have, do they have to pay? Is there communities on both sides? So just, you know, just, uh, and then maybe that, when we write a letter asking for the breakdown, let them know that we're a small community and 3% is, it's uh, massive for our for our taxpayers. Yeah, just my thought. Yep, absolutely. That's McCabe. So Hillier Road was approved, or it is safe, or or doesn't need work. What where does that leave us in this process for uh, you know whistle? <laughs> um. So through the chair, that that's completely separate than the inspection of the crossing. So. I know Nicole was looking into, we're working on that. Yes, we've met somebody on site and we're working on that. We'll have a report probably at the next committee meeting. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. So we just need details. Deets. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The Healing Center design update. Kelly, continue on. Yeah. And I do have uh, Brian Marr, our project manager, online. Brian, are you there? Oh, I see him there. there he is. Hey there, I'll change to a view so I don't look like him. Okay. Oh, and Kelly, I sent you some other images too. I'll just actually resend that. It's in the corporate services folder. This one. Oh, sorry, I didn't think I'd quite be on the agenda yet, so sorry. Uh, my apologies, Chair and Council. No worries. It should be useful to you. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to communicate Douglas Cardinal's vision for the updated healing center imagery to you all. Uh, this was a work in progress, which arose as a result of discussions that happened um, as, as a result of a need to adapt the location of the building within the 200 Main Street site. So Douglas wanted to share some words. She, uh, he and Kelly and I had a long conversation, and this is adapted from his conversation. So I'll just read it to you, uh, and the full conversation is available by recording. But uh, Douglas says, all my buildings have a relationship between the forms that create the people, and that by that he means all the peoples. Everything in nature is geometric and based on the intricate patterns of circles and curves, meaning in his vision of, the, of nature, there are no right angles. The form of the circle is very present in this building and is used at the entrance and expressed in the gentle curves of the walls, which he hopes that evoke the hills of the Shushwab Valley. And then his further discussion on the building uh, follows so when Douglas was in Sycamus with the Doya, he was very much struck by the presence of water and how waters influenced the valley and in particular Sycamus, the houseboat capital of the world. So the relationship of water is very present as the organic influence in my vision of your healing center. Water is the defining feature of Sycamus. The land was shaped and formed by the rivers and the lakes. Water flows in the lake and the wind blows across the top of the water. Water is the highway of the first people, and we continue to remain connected with water in many ways. I wanted to have this element expressed in the building form. You can feel the expression of water flowing, waves forming, cresting along and across the walls and the roof of the building. The blue glass also reflects the water in the lakes and the rivers. So that is the basis of his visioning, uh, which is very, very keyed off of what he had done before, but he had the opportunity with more time to evolve that visioning. Uh, and Kelly, I don't know if you saw the, the set of images that I sent you that attached to this PowerPoint, but they're upgraded images from the ones that you and I had from Douglas last week. Um, Brian, no, I have yet to receive them from you. Okay. Sarah, I Sarah had them. I don't know if she can open or I can forward to you. Sorry. Um, can you, you know how to share your screen? 
I just yeah. Want to... Yeah, I can screen share mine. If not, I have the ones from last week. Okay, no, I will share screen. So let me play presentation slideshow. Okay. Uh, so this image, let me see if I can get it to play slideshow, play from start. There we go. So this first image is the updated imagery and it shows the view of the building looking at it from Main Street. So if you were across Main Street, this would be the main entrance into the lobby. And then as you flow through, so this is an, uh, an open atrium, if you like, there's gonna be, a, 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 he envisions a dome ceiling or open to the stars within this space, not quite defined. And then as you travel through the lobby to the community space, this would be the entrance to the community space. So you could independently enter it. This is what Douglas is talking about is evoking the hills and the waves underneath it, where the, where the hills reach down and touch the water. So it's seamless and the water is represented by the blue glass, which will be multicolored dark and light blue glass that creates that imagery anchored by the rocks which would be uh, a concrete or a, or a rock type stone material on the base. So you'd have the stone with the water, the rolling hills and the imagery evoking that from Main Street. This is the image now, if you were looking at it from the parking lot, so this is the view east. So again, you can see the main entrance here where this is, gives you a bit of idea of the scale of the building. It is a one story building with the community room lifted higher. And so you can see the layers of the building. So that's again evoking the imagery of the hills, the rolling water and the waves cresting. This is the entrance into the um, medical um, side of it. This is again the public entrance to the community side and lobby. This is the image looking from the north. So if you were looking out uh, from the condominium side or the alley along there, this is the, the what we would call the back of the building, which is still beautiful. Again, representing that imagery. Here you can clearly see the, the crest of the wave coming through. You can see the waves flowing through along the top, the wave cresting as it falls over and into the lake with the wind blowing across it. Here's another view. This is the view now from the park or the, the green space. So again, the remainder part of 200 Main Street. This, this one really gives you good imagery of how it flows and the building, the cresting. I believe he's gonna re reinterpret and, and put another wave crest here, which you don't see in this image that he's working on. But this gives you a very clear idea of how he, he sees this flowing. Uh, and then this material is going to be a durable um, wood grained either metal or a board of some type but it won't be exact it won't be made of wood in order to ensure the long-term um, use of it and, and wear and tear on the building so it doesn't need to be replaced within a decade or so questions council any questions okay councillor mccabe yeah thank you um, how are we doing with the design costs, the, the cost? Uh, so we're getting more into the detailed design of the exterior, if you will. Um, is that impacting our, our costs or where are we at? Uh, a couple of things happened. So of course we had to redesign the entire building. Um, Douglas Cardinal understands the nature of it in that we've changed the building design to respect the existing First Nations presence on a portion of the Main Street site. He being a First Nations and residential school survivor has agreed to donate most of his time to redo the design. We don't have the final nice. bill yet, but it's going to be very much discounted from the original design because he wants the healing center to go forward. Wow. Uh, relative to the balance of design, the development permit design is being done with Scott Builders, and that will be submittal ready by the 12th of May. And I believe that cost will be also significantly discounted. I don't have the final dollars yet, though, Councilor McCabe. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly, did you want to add something? 
Yeah, I just wanted to say that this is uh, before council today, just for their their information and their high level blessing. If there's anything that they see that they don't like, because our plan is to have this in front of the planning, the revised development permit in front of the planning and development committee next week, the 17th, and then to bring it to the regular council meeting on the 24th for the actual development permit, because then after that, we can actually start with construction drawings and start because we haven't really spent of this, you know, seven point some million dollar project. We've only spent four hundred thousand or even less than that. Uh, so we'll start spending some money once the development permit is approved and we'll get into the construction drawing piece. So I just wanted everybody to know where we were because our goal is to still be in the ground in the fall. Perfect. Yeah, sounds great. OK, uh, Councillor Rich through the chair. Thank you. Um, and it's a very layman's question, but this is designed for our weather and snow, and then it's going to be the building is going to work for our um, how our like how our weather is here in the valley. Yes, it's designed specifically for the environment. So, and I think Kelly has some better images of what the materials are going to going to be, but it's going to be all weather for season material. Great, thank you, uh, Councillor Beach. Uh, through the chair, oh. uh, um, I'm just, uh, you mentioned uh, domes, open domes uh, and to the stars, which I love the idea, but I'm trying to get a visual of what the rooftop will actually look like. Uh, yeah, so it, it, it will be open. Let me just uh, reshare an image, if I may. Actually, maybe what I'll do, Kelly, is I'll share um, yours. I can share mine. Yeah, I think because you had you had the 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 less um, detailed image, but you had you had the bird's eye views. So the so this is this is the uh, skeleton imagery, not the renderings. But if you click to your next slide, you can kind of see on on the next slide how. I'm working on it. Yeah. So there you can see where how the, there's two levels of roof structure. Uh, and you can see windows that look into the, the community room, which allows light to come in from the east towards the setting sun, which is very, very important for First Nations people. And then you can also see where at the front entrance where there's that curve. So what they're trying to do is decide what is the best way to adapt the use of that space, whether we leave it open air, so it's open to the stars, or whether we put a roof over it uh, with, a, with a curved roof or a flat roof, and then paint imagery on it that, that um, creates homage to the creator, uh, which Douglas would prepare for us. So those are the elements that are still up for discussion that will come out really as we get more into the interior layout and design of it. But those, that kind of shows you how they see it going to the uh, opening up to the to the atmosphere. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Yeah, so when I, maybe this is a question for Kelly, when can we release this updated information like on our website? I mean, there's a lot of questions in the community, like we're making really significant changes to this project. So I just wonder when, I mean, you obviously we have quite a few drawings. How can we get this out into the public domain? I, I don't even have this yet, or I don't think council has this yet, because you just got it. This is a great question, Ian. This is hot off the press. So as, as we had to change the look of it, we had to go back to Douglas, which took some time to get get him to make sure. So, so we are out of, so once we get these development permit drawings here this next week, so it'll all be public, we'll all update our website with all new information. So within the next week or two. Okay, so yes. could we have this public before we do the development permit coming up at planning and development? I, I, I'm just trying to think about process here and and to have this you know information out since you want to have the development permit approved next week and then well, the goal, week after. Correct, correct. So, I mean, the timing's timing's up really to council, right? So if we need more time, we're fine with that. We just want to make sure the project is moving forward. So yeah, this is a public meeting now. So these mm -hmm. visuals, I just 
we just got them. So I didn't have time to go on the agenda, but I will get some more revised ones because Brian's also working with Douglas. He has even some more recent ones that I haven't seen yet. So it's better to get some nicer looking ones and get that on our website. And just one further question, because I, I, I had a couple of people contact me this week about consultations about what goes in the building. Are we, I know this was something that was brought up in the election, and I'm not sure if the last council committed to it. What is our consultation kind of plan for the building going forward? Uh, oh, oh, just, I know that there was consultation around the interior design, like, the programming of the of the building with Dr. Avin um, Satoya, Satoya. Um, that would have been in the fall of 2021, I believe. Um, regarding the consultation, there was comments about um, taking it to the public for the green space design, and that there would be public input on that. If I'm not correct, Kelly. So, Ian, are you asking? But what's going inside the building? Like, so well, maybe I'll, I'll just relay the, the questions that I got okay. from a couple of people is that they're under the impression, rightly or wrongly, I'm not sure if that was the previous council that I, that uh, committed to this, that there would be another town hall meeting about the services and what the actual uh, contents of the building or what what that is going to kind of look like. Um, because I mean, we used to be up the outside of it, but there is questions around programming and, and, and what does that involve? So that was the question that was directed to me. I don't know the answer to that. And I'm not sure if we've, you know, developed what that looks like going forward, if there is going to be another public consultation piece or, or not. Um, just speaking from, I, I don't recall all that okay but i do know that um kelly do you want to grab this one as far as what's going inside uh, and i'm trying to find find this so far because there's actually been a lot of work and a lot of public input already in terms of mm -hmm. what's what's inside we've been capturing this i i think for the last few years and I, we know our medical clinic is going in there and it's going to increase in size. We know that there's going to be a traditional healing space that will be in there, the community space, there's a locum, locum space, and then there's additional space that we're, we're working with Eagle Valley. So their services can, can come in there as well, Eagle Valley Resource Society. And we should know within the next little bit whether interior health is interested and in offering their services public health uh, uh everything that interior health does at parkland mall and moving that into the healing center okay so we're talking to eagle valley resources that they've been involved they the whole the whole the whole time yes <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you through the chair that's a route um <laughs> Uh, a design committee was assigned at one point, but it was it was professionals, right, for services to look at to look at what services uh, would make sense in there. Um, public, I think there were uh, there were town halls. There were a couple of town halls uh, for the public, but there also was a design committee, and we had six of us on that that were professionals uh, from from uh, in, excuse me, interior health um, and uh, Karen Eastland was on there and Eagle Valley Community Support, uh, Janet and I were on there and Colleen Bailey for young family or not Bailey, um, one of our Bunbury uh, who deals with young families and, and babies and stuff all sat on this and Phaedra Idson who was with the seniors housing. So we had a professional design committee to look at services and to actually look at some possible workflows inside. So we've already done that work, but we haven't met for a long time. And now we've redesigned. So um, that is definitely a piece. And then the rest of it, I think we were waiting for Interior Health to come on board because we knew we wanted their services in there. So, and, and so that's kind of, why we couldn't take it out to the public, right. basically. But work has definitely been done 
on the interior design and the flow, the flow through the building, which is really important. Councillor Bailey. Just a, so we started off with a, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, a 25,000 uh, 25, square foot plan. And are we down, where are we at now on a 15,000 or? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the the grant application said twenty five thousand. We never really had any plans with twenty five thousand. And then when we did our assessment, what we're doing is, and we we've got an approved scope change for fifteen thousand. It's all it's all good. So it's still at fifteen thousand. It hasn't changed the size. We're trying to. Um, create efficient spaces that are multifunctional. So we can offer the same amount of services, but have multifunctional spaces. Okay. In our, yeah. So we're still at the 15,000 that we talked about. 15,000 okay. square feet, correct. And there were some, uh, in the in the grant writing itself, there were some things that aren't going in. Like it's, it's the, the, the scope has changed somewhat. And that's why I'm asking about getting this information out there, because I know, it's where it might have started and what people were thinking and where it is now is it's it's in a different realm. I mean, it's it, there's I think it, it it helps us a lot to get the information out, the design out, the whatever the rough kind of thoughts about what's inside. I, I think that would be a benefit to have. And it certainly would have, in my opinion, a benefit to have that out prior to us doing development permits, you know, I just think on, in the terms of the process, it'd be nice to have all that out, then it comes to planning and development, then it comes back to council. And this is a period where if people had thoughts, concerns, this would be a good time to have some of those concerns brought forward and then dealt with. That's a good idea. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Uh, Councillor Evans. Hello, thank you. I am... Um... I hope you can hear me okay. The yeah. um, the question I had for Brian was, Brian, the uh, the curvy, um, the, the the hills on top. Um, at, in this design that we're looking at today, is that a, um, uh, I guess, a pseudo curve on the top? So it's like the old Western buildings where there's a pseudo, is the roof actually curved? The, the, the roof is actually flat. Okay. So, so the roof itself is flat. And then, yeah, the parapet, or as you say in the old Western, the, the parapet is there and it screens the mechanical units above, but it, do, it does serve the, the function of creating the, the barrier between the edge of the roof and the walls. So, so a portion of it is, as you say, um, false parapet to create that imagery but a portion of it is fundamental to the building structure. So everything up, up, I would say, if you you need it about eight inches above the top of the roof to create the fastening of the roof to the walls. And above that, that is the decorative element. Yeah, great. Thank you. And uh, may I ask one more question, Mr. Chair? Please, sir. Yep. Okay. Um, when it comes to uh, um, some of the stuff inside as well, um, it was long ago decided there'd be things like uh, physiotherapy in there and, and that kind of thing as well to just augment the point of the building to be a medical center. Um, I think, again, it's important to reiterate that um, this is not going to be a drug rehab facility. Um, where that's the one thing that we have to keep pounding on because that's the disinformation that's out there and it's stubborn. And we have to just let people know, no, this is the healing center is a medical facility but it's not a drug rehab facility, which uh, creates a necessary fear in people. That's correct. Yeah, there, there's no drug rehabilitation. There's over no, there's no overnight stay um, in this in this building. So it it's a. Uh, I'm just going to share quickly. I don't know if this image came up. Do you see my image on screen? This is, this is the original programming from the building, which remains true today. The configuration has changed, but this shows where there was one locum residence in the space. The, the, the original design showed two. This, is, this goes back to May 2022, this particular image. It had the community center in the green here. It, uh, the blue was staff and support services, so restrooms, lunchroom, staff room, conference room, lobby area. 
The purple is all the primary care health clinic and the, the First Nations Healing Center. And all these elements are preserved in the building. So this, this is the slightly more rectangular shape. It has gotten more square. There is actually a programming layout for this, but these are the elements that were, were shown to the community at large uh, in 2022, spring 2022. And this continues to be the consistent intention for what's going to go within the building. So none of that has varied. Uh, and I believe there has been quite a bit of in, in dialogue back and forth between the DOS, certainly within the professional community in terms of the doctors in BCIHA and Eagle Valley, but it, it also has been articulated clearly to the community at large what's going into the building. So I share that image to you. And then there is one that's been updated relative to the programming as it fits in the new building. It's all the same programming. Hey, yes, thank excellent. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Brian. Councillor Beach. Thank you, through the chair. Um, that design process uh, that the design committee went through never did end up going to council because we had to hold up because of interior health. Yeah. So that. Right. So there was a whole process that we went through with the other design of the building to ensure um, that we could have usage of that, that building when the clinic was, we didn't have to have the whole building open to, to have access to certain things that the public would want to use after hours or before hours. I think that that interior design needs to go back to um, a design committee because it doesn't look uh, familiar and we worked hard on that. So I can just, that's a very old drawing that- Yeah, it was. So there has been work on that, Brian, since May of 22. He knows that, he knows. Okay. He's, got it all. He's yeah. just showing what's. We need to revisit it if we've got interior health on. And the reality is, yeah. any design we do in, inside is irrelevant if interior health is now coming in and they want 3,000. So we're going to have to do that again. Have to work around. Yeah, them. they'll have to be worked. The design, I mean, yeah. the design evolved. So here's this just again, I'll just for a quick example, this kind of yes. shows the evolution of the design based on the old layout, which now. The, based on the configuration change of the physical envelope has changed. But this kind of shows the, the development as you move through it. So this here shows the traditional healing element. This shows the community rooms. This showed the locum suites. This was the hydrotherapy. Uh, this there, There's a welcome desk and invitation in lobby. So it was developed. And then we, we put it on hold once we knew that this building shape no longer was uh, a viable opportunity for the building because of the restrictions that became uh, apparent from the archeological yeah. investigation. So yeah. I, I agree with you, Councillor Beach, we, there needs to be re-engagement. There are two key stakeholders that have not been uh, attentive in the process, being our First Nations partners and BCIHA. They need to really be at the table for uh, the DOS to, to get to the end process without designing in a vacuum. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bushel. Thank you through the chair. Uh, Brian, I uh, just wanted to thanks for the, thank you for the update. Um, I just want to uh, add to Siobhan or Councillor Rich's uh, uh, concerns about the, I always remember in the beginning when we talked to Douglas Cardinal and yourself and Scott Builders about the uh, materials used. And we have a very, very high humidity here in the wintertime and uh, everything swells, anything wood swells. So we are always concerned about that. We did bring that up. And, um, and then of course, all of, with the uh, curved walls and the curve, you know, the parapet uh, flashing is really difficult uh, on curves. <laughs> so it just- yeah, because... and, and nobody wanted, wanted wood more than Douglas Cardinal, but maybe, um... Yeah, Kelly, Kelly, can you just show the material that we're considering right now? Because I know you've got that in your in your deck. Yeah, we're, we're trying to find a modern material that achieves 
the same look and feel, but provides for curvability, durability, and uh, weather temperature sensitivity. I've so, got it up on the screen here. Yeah. yeah, and there's lots of materials that, yeah. uh, that yeah. curves and look like wood. So yeah, just just a, just a you know a caution again, just a reminder. Thank you very much. Okay, any other questions? Well, I guess our, our our concern is getting this communicated out to the public as soon as possible. I know that this is a public meeting, but perhaps on social media we could get it. Just grab a couple of these updates moving forward. These are the next steps. Mm -hmm. Just so that we yeah. so that we keep the process going as quickly as 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 we are. So, but just making sure that we're informing the public as we go. Yeah, and Brian, if you could send me the the most updated renderings that you have from Douglas, so then we can put something together for our website. Will do. We appreciate. Yeah, it. I just got those today. So. Good. Yeah. No. All good. Thank you for sharing them. Yeah. Hey, Council, you all good? Everybody's good. Brian, thank you so much. Appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. I'm looking forward to spending summer out there. <laughs> Please pass on our thanks to Douglas Cardinal for uh, helping with the costs. Yeah, yeah. Du yeah. So yeah. And, and so Douglas's fee was, I think, one hundred fifty thousand. I think he's going to charge ten. Oh, wow. that's amazing. So he 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 really believes in the healing center, and uh, so he's waiving the bulk of his fees. Basically, he's it, it's just his. Uh, staff CAD time is always charging nothing for the design. Mm, thank you so much. Council appreciates that. Yeah, well, sure. He, thank you. He really hopes that uh, that this project happens. So, thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate the time. Bye for now. This is this is such an exciting project. Just having a new clinic in our community and being able to attract doctors because they're going to have this brand new facility to be working in in a beautiful location and that work-life balance where they don't have to manage the clinic they can just manage their patients so i'm i'm been super excited about this go ahead council beach i mean this has to do with the healing healing center sorry but it it doesn't and it does we have a new dentist we have a new dentist coming into our other building are we talking to him? Is he interested in actually having a space in the healing center? Uh, yeah, so we, we've been approached by a few few people, pharmacists, dentists that are potentially interested in the healing center. So step one is we need to make sure interior health is on board because we have to make yeah. sure we have enough space to house these people. Yeah. Right. So. So, yeah, there are a few few people that are potentially interested. So step one is interior health and. I'm pushing them very hard and I need an answer really quick here. So, and that is awesome. And yeah. tenants do <laughs> help with the cost, right? So not only panel of patients, but tenants do help. So yeah, hopefully this will be. And if, yeah. And if interior health is, is not interested, which would be a shame, but that's okay. Uh, we do have a list of people that are interested also in coming mm -hmm. to in the health center that provide dental, physio, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So there will be opportunities to have health-related services in that building, regardless. Excellent. Navigate through that. Okay, one quick one. Yeah, just, I, I mean, I certainly hope Interior Health is interested because it would make a lot of sense for that yeah. uh, mm -hmm. to be in that building. I think not only for them, but also for our community members. I 100% agree. And a full functioning um, uh, lab, like not, not full functioning. I mean, but I, that's right. Yeah. Five days a week where they are taking blood five days a week, you know, so um, Councillor Beach. Uh, I, oh, it's already on. Okay. <laughs> I just want to, um, I don't know what I want to say now. Let's move on. <laughs> I, I've lost the thought. <laughs> conversation that's exciting news new designs here um okay so council reports councillor rich uh -huh. sorry did i miss one yeah oh i'm sorry you guys hey council beach oh yeah <laughs> maybe that's no that was me going oh yeah okay um actually Juan and i have have worked on this drug awareness uh, education together. 
and um, you've I've given you all of the poster that is already out through the interagency. It's it's out quite widely through the interagency with the big QR code on it. <laughs> Get them to a registration uh, email, and then the other the other piece is something that will be sent to them when they register and want and need more information about the evening. Uh, who's speaking, what the topics are in detail. So the first one is shorter, less information, but it gives them the way to register. Then they get um, event information. Um, if you look at the list of people who are on, are, who are presenting as experts uh, in the area or in this field or this concern, um, We've got a great, we've got, we've managed to attract some really great people, uh, several from Interior Health, and they're really keen to be part of it. So it's, um, it started out a little bit, we were a little bit nervous, but then it just kind of opened up with the support of Donna Helgeson, I must say, um, reaching out for us. Um, so uh, you can see that we've got seven, we've got seven speakers and um, so I think predominantly it'll be held in the secondary school library. We still have to approach um, the schools to see if we can get this stuff sent out to their families, There's right? So now that it's done up, this goes out to the families and then they will be more aware. Um, so we have to do that. Um, but the, 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 concept is that everybody will be able to, or most people, even some of the presenters will come in by Zoom. Um, we'll be in the library. The library is not very big in, in the secondary school. I don't expect a lot of in-person people. So um, what we will do is run the panel uh, and all the presentations will, will run. Uh, people will be asked to, they'll be muted and asked to remain muted but uh, take notes if they have questions and uh, or write in the chat. And mm -hmm. Siobhan's gonna look after the chat room and I'm gonna do the facilitation of the speakers. Um, and so uh, that's how it'll work. Um, we have the option, I've been told that if it runs a little bit over, our, our Zoom session won't immediately shut down. Um, and we're, we're recording. So um, we can take the questions and ask people to leave an email or a, a phone number so that we can actually contact them, get their contact information. What, it, what Siobhan and I decided would, would be best would be that the um, people uh, phoning in or Zooming in be anonymous if they wish to be. They don't have to be. They can sign in by their name. But if they wish to be anonymous, then they can participate and ask their questions or ask for help if that's the case um, in an anonymous way. And I feel that that's really important to all of the education that we're doing. Excellent. Thank and, you. Yeah. And I don't know. Ron and Pam for taking this on. You know, when, when this was passed down to us and we decided to um, put bylaws in place, criminalization of illicit drugs in our parks. This didn't come with uh, education. It was just handed down saying, this is you know, what we're gonna do as of January 31st. There was no education attached to it. Yeah. And Sigma stepped up and went, no, you know what? This isn't gonna work for us in our parks. And we did what we thought was right for the safety of our community. You guys are just taking this a step forward and being such community, Trendsetters. Now you're taking that piece that we've already voted on and put bylaws in, but now you're taking that piece out to our community and you're educating our community and bringing them together. So hats off to both of you. This is a great project and uh, fully, it, we support, the district supports it, of course. It is in your portfolios and I think the Resource Centre is um, the Resource Centre is sponsoring it. So. Yeah. But yeah. thank you both very much. It's a lot of work and it, it looks like it's going to be a great program. So thanks. Oh, round of applause. I, I just want to say, Madam Mayor, that in your 
media responses, I was inspired to, to be able to say that the, it is the education piece that we can do here in this, you know, we may not have the answers, we may not, you know, um, be able to do some of the other stuff that people would like us to do, but we can do the education piece in this town. The community can, and the community can learn, be more aware, and be more supportive of people who need help. Absolutely. Thank you for that. But thanks to council because collaborative. Yes, absolutely. We brought it together and we made it work. Yes. Right. So that's perfect. Thank you so much. Councilor Rich. Just to add on to what Pam was saying. Um, so this is, is education awareness. We're trying to bring interior health and other um, stakeholders in together and hopefully have them start collaborating and, and moving forward to, to bringing awareness to our province and how we're managing the drug crisis. Um, and then Pam and I are also looking at doing like kind of an October thing that's going to be kind of the next level. Um, and hopefully Pam and I are sitting in, in the back row and um, our leaders are um, taking this on, but we're, we're trying to get everyone, I'd like the, the stakeholders in this to come together because they haven't been brought together either. I think a lot of people have been left holding the bag, not just sick and loose. So this is kind of our step to say, let's get on it. I think, yeah, can I um, just add to that too? Um, I agree. There's too many people working in silos and as, a, and I think this is brilliant, bringing them all together. When, and I said this to Malcolm today, when I met with the conservation officer and met all five of them in here, I said, you know, the best plan for you guys is to go meet Murray at the R with the RCMP and start working with Murray. And I brought John into the meeting. If everyone is talking together and singing off the same song sheet, it certainly makes our jobs easier. But as council, I think that's sort of our mandate is to bring everyone together, get rid of the silos and start communicating as, as one unit. So. Um, Councillor McCabe. Yeah, I, I just wanted to commend uh, Pam and, and Siobhan on, on a great job mm -hmm. in a very short time frame and very professional and very well organized. And I think Councillor Rich is right. Uh, I think uh, you have created a model that the government is going to adopt and probably roll out across the province. Perfect. Perfect. Trendsetters. We are leaders. Go ahead, Pam Beach. Uh, to the chair, I just, I want to, um, I want to just point out that the professionalism that was done by Eagle Valley Community yes. oh, okay. I'm not capable of this level. Um, so yes, they, uh, Janet uh, was a, and was a huge help in putting this together in a format that looked so great. And and uh, helped with the editing, and uh, Heather O'Brien helped with the barcode and stuff because neither one of us are technical up there. So Eagle Valley Community Support Society actually put this piece together. We just took them the structure, and they are totally supporting what we're doing here. Um, so yeah, I can't take the credits for how professional it looks. That is that is Janet and Heather at the support society yeah okay. so um yeah i, I just want to just go back to an experience the experience at the health summit that i i shared with you that everyone is so frustrated at the lack of working together and the, the detachment between levels of the, of our structure our system that when this started to just come together. It was like a landslide. It was like the enthusiasm and it, it took a week or so, but it just, everybody wanted to be a part of it. The school district has got their counselor, you know, their consultant in there, the schools, everybody. And you can see that we've got Lori is on side. Lori Weber is going to be uh, on as well. And yeah, it's really heartwarming because that was the message that came out of that health summit in January is that we are so fragmented and we're not working together and there is no connection. And when we say what is needed, it never gets to the ministry. It never actually gets translated. 
um, and it doesn't come from close to home. So what we've done is we've taken all of those people to bring them together and they are close to home so they can actually thanks yes teach us absolutely thank you i just have um i just have uh councillor evans that wants to councillor evans uh sorry my hand was enough i'm ready to share when it's my turn but i wasn't trying to ask a question <laughs> you're okay oh good okay Councillor Rich. I just also wanted to add in, just in case someone noticed, um, we have asked for a uh, First Nations representative um, on this topic, um, and we have set aside a time time allotment for yeah. that person. Um, at this point, we haven't been able to um, have someone confirm, but we have also touched on that and are hoping that we do have a representative there for that. Yeah, excellent. And we will add them as soon as we have them. We've yes. allotted time. Yeah, so perfect. Thank you. Any more comments? Thank you. Very great job. Great job. Sycamus is always uh, ahead of the pack. Proud to be those leaders. Okay, we have council reports now. So, Councilor Ridge, did you want to kick that off? Through the chair. Um, what did I do this last little while? I uh, worked on the drug awareness uh, piece with Pam, which has been uh, enlightening and a bit of a struggle occasionally. And a lot of reading. Um, did the uh, Indigenous uh, Culture Program the other day, um, and thanks to Shauna Cole, that was really well done. Uh, really good training. Um, I did the bear training here in Chambers. Um, Monday was I here? Monday I was here for that. And thank you for Sarah for coming and getting us all set up for that. Uh, we had Silka, and I listened to the planning meeting. And my kids are getting used to focusing <laughs> in on that. My 12 year, old, 12 year old knows so much about planning. It's crazy. That's awesome. Future planners. That's what we need. Yeah, we have. So. Through the chair. Um, yeah, it was a busy, I guess it's been a while since uh, we had a council meeting. Um, April 19th, I guess uh, we had a planning development meeting. On the 19th, I also attended a caribou recovery program update uh, upstairs. Uh, found out that our boring glacier is now going to be closed to snowmobilers. Which is a good thing or a bad thing, I guess. I'm, um, you know, some of the club members are a little upset, but uh, we also heard that uh, our Quise Boulder herd is basically almost expired, and uh, there's only a, a few left, and they're probably going to transport those, which we kind of knew along. Uh, which will, which will see what happens with Quise Mountain. Where hopefully everything stays open there, but they'll be moving that herd north, probably to the Bischoff area, which is north of up. Uh, uh, Great Mountain up further north. Um, April 20th, uh, Daryl and I met uh, with a couple of concerned residents at Two Mile in regards to the development out there. Just a little concerned about the trees being coming down because they're kind of really big trees on the right on the property line. So we're uh, I know that the the machines have showed up there and they're getting ready to start taking trees down. Um, so we're trying to navigate that um, with uh, Scott and uh, Daryl. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, also an offense. Uh, the developer has indicated he didn't say he's putting up a fence, but uh, he, you know he's looking at it. So we're trying to keep uh, keep everybody happy out there. I also attended a round uh, round of Shishwap, uh Trails Roundtable Working Group meeting on the twenty first. What else do we do? Silga Silga was pretty interesting. Um, that was a great uh, great session down there. I was able to attend a couple of days. I had to work uh, on the Friday. And, uh, but yeah, I know it was pretty good. We attended the uh, uh, recovery of housing markets, you know, the economic development uh, um, program that they had there, that was good. And I also attended a BC assessment one. Uh, Communities in Bloom, April 29th. Um, just wanted to thank Deb and um, all the group that helped out. I also want to thank Brian Labore and Todd Kylo at Twin Anchors for the use of their trailers. Uh, dump trailers, it makes it a lot easier when we have dump trailers. And uh, yeah, we uh, had Jeff, uh, old counselor Jeff Malmus come out and he helped out. And uh, we had a big group of volunteers. I think there was 30, 30 something volunteers, 36 or something like that. Uh, I want to thank the staff. Uh, had, you know, everybody kind of took their posts and Scott was out at Two Mile and uh, Kelly. And uh, well, I just said we had all, all, all lots of staff and uh, it's good to see the kids there. It kind of reminded me 
back in the day when I was uh, a kid and my dad used to haul me and my brothers out and we used to pick garbage in the ditch. With cousin Moses. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> while I was in with Aspen this week, uh, they were picking garbage from Pigeon Lake all the way through to Wetaspin, mm -hmm. which is about 50 kilometers. And there was people on both sides of the ditches. I, I was amazed how many people were in the ditches taking garbage and putting it on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. So that was good. Um, so and thank Deb. Uh, Deb does a great job spearheading that. And she did a great job over at the seniors and thank the Legion for the lunch. Everything was good there. Um, what else we do? Uh, we had step code breakfast, Scott and the crew put on step code breakfast. And then that day we had a planning uh, meeting. Um, Scott and Kelly and Ian and I had a zoning meeting uh, on May the 4th. And then today we were at another meeting, a zoning meeting with a developer. So yeah, we've been busy. So that's that's all I got to report. Thank you. Oh, you're tough back. Well, so oh, Kelsey, Kelsey, that is. Okay. What have you been up to? Yeah, oh. Well, just a few of the same at Southern Interior Local Government Association attended that uh, planning committee uh, and the builders breakfast for the step code and uh, attended most of the cultural training. Awesome. Put it. Thank you. Councillor Beach. Um, yes, uh, similar Silga. I actually did all four days. Good. <laughs> wow. Um, really? The highlight for me, I think, was the this um, water reclamation plant tour. And a uh, very fancy, nice, clean name for a sewage treatment plant. <laughs> But um, that was very, very inspiring. Um, um, they're moving in the direction of renewable energy in one, a new facility where they'll take their, take it and they'll use it to heat mm -hmm. and produce energy. So it was quite, uh, it was also, I found out that they partner with Kelowna um, to compost the, the solids. So there were some things that yeah I learned about that I thought were really innovative and I wish we were big enough to do the same thing. Um, so that was I, I really enjoyed that. Um, and uh, let me see. I, other than that, it was a planning committee meeting. Um, I did take that in by Zoom. Um, and um, the cultural education uh that we just had um uh so and uh, and a retreat and strategic planning session with my own organization which you know sort of overlaps a little bit on on all the stuff that we do um yeah uh, that's all i can uh think remember <laughs> thanks councillor <Kelsey> beach <laughs> councillor evans let's go up to you before we go to councillor bailey Hi there. Yeah, I uh, enjoyed attending the Southern Interior Local Government Association Conference in Vernon. Um, and uh, I took quite a few seminars that really taught a lot of good stuff about taxation and trying to understand that better. And uh, a good seminar on the environment. And this is my first point today is it really uh, struck home that, you know, with all the rain that we've had, this spring and the snow that's been in the mountains, we're still going to be facing um, quite a hot summer. And uh, the key is to be thinking about water conservation. So I have, uh, um, I'm an old dog learning new tricks. Just wet the toothbrush, shut the water off, brush your teeth. Because I mean, if you let that water run as long as you brush your teeth, it's amazing how many pictures of water you'll fill up. And uh, we want to conserve that because it's going to be a hot summer. And with a lot of people in our population probably tripling in the summertime, it's, it's very important uh, for our community to conserve our water. So I just wanted to put that out there. The other thing that I want to highlight that I picked up was um, if anyone in town is, uh, you know, internet's important. I've, I've had students show up when the hub is closed, sitting at the picnic table so they can use the internet to do, to do things and uh if you can't afford internet nothing to be ashamed of um there is a great thing that telus is doing called mobility for good that will uh will give you next to nothing internet so you can um have that for your family it's important and uh and the other thing is i just wanted to 
I had a lot of conversations at the conference with people that were um, in the same job as us. And uh, thank you, um, Council, for the good decision, I think, to protect people um, about drug use in the parks and stuff like that. And, and uh, Mayor Colleen, your statements on the news were really good. We were able to help other towns um, by taking the stand we did. At the same time, I just want to balance out that um, we, we don't want anybody to feel bad about something they're struggling with if it comes to drugs. Tell somebody, get some help. Okay. It's very important. And, um, and, you know, we all struggle with something. And, uh, you know, I struggle with a food addiction myself. I have to work on that for myself, for my health. So, you know, it's important that we, um, we say that, you know, talk to a friend, get some help. It's out there. Um, tell somebody and, and don't, don't be alone because we're losing too many people. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Evans. Councillor Bailey. Okay, it'll be really quick. A lot of planning and development meetings and um, SILGA. I think no one's mentioned that our resolutions all passed at SILGA. Oh, you were going to mention, I'm sorry to- uh, Don't use them again. Thunder. Nope, not at all. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> one was controversial-ish, but uh, at the end of the day, it prevailed. Uh, you, uh, I think, very sensible uh, resolution to ask the province to step up and do their jobs when they actually put rules and regulations in place, which I think is reasonable. And um, yeah, just really focusing on a lot of planning and development, really, at this point. Awesome. Up to you. Thank you. Um, I'll be quick. Uh... I, I have, uh, yeah, there's quite a few things on my, my to-do list. I met with Sergeant McNeil uh, a couple of weeks ago just, just to discuss this plan with Sycamus and suggested that um, for busy long weekends, we have more boots on the street. So just so that the RCMP can interact with the community, because I think that bond is very important that pe that our community gets to know the RCMP. Um, I attended a CSRD Shoe Shop Executive meeting uh, I've been to nothing big came out of that. The chamber AGM was last week. Some new board members uh, were elected and congratulations to Sam Dunnett, who is the new president. So uh, we will be working with, uh, to Sam, with Sam as the president of the chambers. So that's pretty exciting and good for, good for Sam. Uh, I went to the municipal directors meeting. And so that's mayors with uh, municipalities. And we discussed a lot about sharing, sharing resources. So, you know, we've we've fought a bit with sweepers this past season, which we do every spring, it seems. So, you know, we've got some ideas of how maybe we can move forward and check into other things to, to share, as well as building inspectors and things like that, and just kind of group resources and, and share them. So um, that was really good. Uh, attended a CSRD board meeting. Um, uh, that was, there was nothing earth shattering that came out of that. Silga, I'm happy with the resolutions. I do, all three of them did pass. I want to be, I want to specifically um, thank Councillor Beach. You did an amazing job on speaking to our resolution. Councillor McCabe, you did a great job speaking to our resolution a couple times. You had to, I, I love the way, I love the way you have to get back up there and go, oh, no, no, I need to, that was perfect. Thank you so much. And Councillor Bushell, you did a great job of speaking to our resolution. So, you know what, and you're right, one we just snuck by, but I mean, we, all of our resolutions were, um, were moved forward. And I think we're resolution kings here in Sycamus. Not only leaders who are kings of resolutions. Um, had an interview with the rural coordination of BC um, healthcare in regards to our award. And we're a very unique community. Again, you know, I can't say this enough. Here we are leading the pack again uh, with our owning our own healthcare facility, purchasing it and moving forward with it. And that's pretty exciting. And people are looking, looking to Sycamus to see how, you know, how we're doing that and how we manage to move it through the processes. And so we shared uh, shared some information on that. Uh, I went to the mayors and chairs seasonal preparedness uh, and there was a lot of talk about climate change and to Councillor Evans point, we're tinder dry. So um, we have right now uh, communications. Nicole's working on some social uh, 
media with communications, watch your butts, um, which kind of a little play on words, kind of funny, but anyway, watch your butts, mind your campfires, mind any fires, make sure you have hoses and water buckets if you're burning anything and don't leave fires unattended. I mean, these are common sense things, but you know what, we forget and we, we do need to be reminded. Um, I'm arranging a meeting, uh, hopefully in the next week or two with Active TAC and COC, just so that I can share our strategic priorities with them. Again, I want to take those three silos that we have, and I want to bring us all together, all working together and singing off the same song sheet. So that's was part of my mandate running for mayor. So I just, I want to make sure that uh, we're communicating and working together and we all know our lanes and how we can build active tourism and our businesses together with the with the council and the chamber. Um, I'd like to thank Gord, Deb for um, community cleanup, all the volunteers, you guys did a great job. Thank you so much for all of that. Um, I think that that is just about it for me. Um, yeah, it's it's been very busy. So I'm ready, we're ready to take some questions from the gallery, none. We're res ready to take some some Zoom questions. Deb Heap. Go ahead, Deb. Deb. Oh, it's a, Deb. It's a false alarm, maybe. Are you on mute? Yes. I asked her on mute. Maybe that was earlier. No. There we go. Hey, Deb, you there? <laughs> Deb? <laughs> Just give her a minute to... Okay, while we're waiting for Deb, does anyone else have any questions? Hey, maybe we won't be waiting for Deb. Are we going into a recess or are we going to adjourn? We adjourn and then go into the regular council meeting. Okay. Yeah, and I've got that here. But I don't need to do it right now, do I? Uh, and then go right into regular council and recess or and into going. in camera. Okay, mm -hmm. Deb, you there? Yes, but no. Yes, she is, but no. And she's trying so hard in her. She's I, like, I can feel, I can feel her energy right now. She's like, oh. I have been there. We're talking about her. Oh, I see her face. Oh, there's still oh, sound. Okay, we can see you. We can see you, Deb. Can you hear us? Someone FaceTime her. Is she Thumbs up. saying forget it? Or what is she saying? She's she yes. Don't worry about it, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Saying don't worry hey, about Deb, it. Deb, we'll catch you next time. Flagged on okay. Perfect. Uh, but thank you for all your hard work with the community cleanup and your volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, recommendation that committee of the whole for May 10th, 2023 be adjourned at 320. Councillor Beach, Councillor McCabe, all in favor. Okay, we are done. <laughs>